Woman Suffrage and Politics Forward by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Roger Schuler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Roger Schuler. This book is dedicated on behalf of the women who have gone before to the women who come after. Why the book is written. The campaign for woman suffrage in America long since ended. Gone are the days of agitating, organizing, educating, pleading, and persuading. No more forever will women descend on state legislatures and the National Congress in the effort to wrest the suffrage from state and national legislators. The gates to political enfranchisement have swung open. The women are inside. In the struggle up to the gates, in unlocking and opening the gates, women had some strange adventures. They learned some strange things. Especially startling became their experiences and their information when woman suffrage once crossed the devious trail of American politics. It is with that point of intersection that this book concerns itself. We have left it to others to write the details of suffrage history. Those details fill six huge volumes. We have left it to others to tell the immortal story of the services of individual suffragists. Here we eliminate names to emphasize work. We have left it to others, too, to synthesize American politics. This book's essential contribution must be sought in its revelation of the bearing of American politics upon the question of woman suffrage. It is impossible to make that revelation adequately without a summary of the 72 years of campaign for the enfranchisement of women in the United States, together with a survey of American politics for the last 55 years of that period. The two are interlocked. Neither story is complete without the inclusion of the other, and this story is not comprehensible without the inclusion of both. But our summary of the woman movement will be brief. Our summary of American politics will be brief. Our emphasis will lie where woman movement and American politics met in mutual menace. Our revelations will illumine political crises with which the suffrage cause was closely identified and over whose motivation suffragists had to keep sharp watch. Throughout the suffrage struggle, America's history, her principles, her traditions stood forth to indicate the inevitability of woman suffrage to suggest that she would normally be the first country in the world to give the vote to women. Yet, the years went by, decade followed decade, and 26 other countries, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Municipal, British East Africa, Burma, Municipal, Canada, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Great Britain, Holland, Hungary, Iceland, Isle of Man, Latvia, Latonia, Luxembourg, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Romania, Municipal, Rhodesia, Russia, Sweden, gave the vote to their women while America delayed. Why the delay? It is a question that was the despair of two generations of American women. It is a question that students of history and national psychology will ponder through generations to come. We think that we have the answer. It was not an antagonistic public sentiment, nor yet an uneducated or indifferent public sentiment. It was the control of public sentiment, the deflecting and the thwarting of public sentiment, through the trading and the trickery, the buying and the selling of American politics. We think that we can prove it. Suffragists consider that they have a case against certain combines of interests that systematically fought suffrage with politics and effectively delayed suffrage for years. We think that we can make that case. We find it difficult to concede to the general opinion that, because of the tendency to overestimate the importance of events with which they are most familiar, those who have been a part of the movement are disqualified to write its history. We are sure that history would be worthless if it took no account of the observations made within a movement by those who have been a part of it. That is why we, who have had an opportunity, to become acquainted with facts which throw light upon the political aspects of the woman's suffrage question, feel compelled to pass our knowledge on to others. The sources of all our information, when not otherwise indicated, are the archives of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which contain continuous reports and other data from 1848 to 1922. 
Documents of this kind decline in interest for the general public as the movement they chronicle recedes into the past, but the facts and deductions drawn from them and here assembled should prove of significance to the advocates, perhaps especially the women advocates, of each recurring struggle in the evolution of democracy. Carrie Chapman Catt, Nettie Roger Schuler. End of the foreword. Chapter One of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. How the Women's Suffrage Movement Began. When, during the last decade, the great suffrage parades, armies of women with banners orange and black yellow and blue and purple and green and gold went marching through the streets of the cities and towns of america when suffrage canvassers knocking at the doors of america were a daily sight when the suffragist on the soap-box was heard on every street corner when huge suffrage mass meetings were packing auditoriums from end to end of the country when lively suffrage stunts were rousing and stirring the public when suffrage was in everybody's mouth and on the front page of every newspaper, few paused to ask how it all started, where it all came from. It was just there, like breakfast. To the unimaginative man on the street corner watching one of those suffrage parades, the long lines of marching women may have seemed to come out of nowhere, to have no starting place, no connection with his grandmother and his great-grandmother. To the same man, the insistent tapping of those suffrage canvassers, the commotion of the suffrage mass meetings, the repetition of those suffrage stunts, the incessant news of suffrage in the daily press, may have seemed unrelated acts, irrelevant to social history. Yet it was all part of social history, and had immediate connection with other phases of social history. For the demand for woman suffrage was the logical outcome of two preceding social movements, both extending over some centuries. One, a man movement, evolving toward control of governments by the people. The other, a woman movement, with its goal the freeing of women from the masculine tutelage to which law, tradition, and custom bound them. These movements advanced in parallel lines, and the enfranchisement of woman was an inevitable climax of both. Neither the man movement nor the woman movement had a dated beginning. In the struggle upward toward political freedom, men were called upon to overthrow the universally accepted theory of the divine right of kings to rule over the masses of men. Women, the universally accepted theory of the divine right of men to rule over women. The American Revolution forever destroyed the divine right of kings theory in this country, but it left untouched the theory of the divine right of man to rule over woman. Men and women believed it with equal sincerity. The church taught it. Customs were based upon it. The law endorsed it. And the causes which created the belief had been so long lost in obscurity that men claimed authority for it in the laws of God. All opposition to the enfranchisement of women emanated from that theory. Students of human progress might have predicted, at the inception of the American Republic, that, should it continue, universal manhood and womanhood suffrage would become inevitable. The official announcement of the causes that led the American patriots into revolution emphasized two maxims as explanatory of all their grievances, namely, taxation without representation is tyranny, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Although in the minds of the colonists these aphorisms undoubtedly were limited in application to the relation which the colonies bore to their mother country, it was as clear to individual men and women then as to hundreds of thousands of them a hundred and forty years later that a nation that proclaimed these principles upon the one hand and denied them upon the other applied them to men and refused to apply them to women presented so untenable an inconsistency that sooner or later professions and deeds would have to be squared 
yet not only was the battle for woman suffrage fought longer in the united states it was fought harder it engaged the lifelong energies of a longer list of women called into action a larger organization in proportion to population and involved a greater cost in money personal sacrifice and ingenuity than the suffrage campaign of any other land and when in nineteen twenty the final victory came to the woman suffrage cause in the land of its birth the rejoicing was sadly tempered by the humiliating knowledge that twenty-six other countries had outdistanced america in bestowing political liberty upon their women more american suffragists knew that their victory had even then been virtually wrung from hesitant and often resentful political leaders while the vote had come to the women of many other lands as a spontaneous and liberal concession to the common appeal for justice and that too without serious effort on the women's part the delay in america was not due to the retarded growth of the general woman movement for the rate of progress of that movement had been more rapid in the united states than in any other country as a brief review will show taking the year eighteen hundred as a fixed point from which to measure progress the investigator will find the civil and legal status of women practically the same as that of several preceding centuries although there were signs of a coming revolt and in north america the personal liberty of women had been much extended under the influence of the freer institutions of the western hemisphere married women at that date were not permitted in any country except russia to control their property nor to make a will to all intents and purposes they did not own property the common law in operation in great britain and the united states held husband and wife to be one and that one the husband the legal existence of the wife was so merged in that of her husband that she was said to be dead in law not only did the husband control the wife's property collect and use her wages select the food and clothing for herself and children decide upon the education and religion of their children but to a very large extent he controlled her freedom of thought speech and action the husband possessed the right to will the children even unborn children to other guardians if the wife offended the husband he possessed the legal right upheld by public opinion to punish her the courts interfering only when the chastisement exceeded the popular idea of appropriate severity humane affectionate husbands treated their wives as loved companions and there were happy wives and homes but upon the wives of fickle ignorant brutal husbands always numerous the oppression of the law fell with crushing force although single women were legally as independent as men it was contrary to accepted form for them to manage their own business affairs what women were unaccustomed to do the world believed them incapable of doing and they had in consequence neither confidence in themselves nor public encouragement to attempt ventures of independence very few occupations were open to women and these were monopolized by the poor it was accounted a family disgrace for a woman of the middle or upper classes to earn money the unmarried woman of such classes dubbed old maid forbidden by public opinion to support herself even were work and wages available became a dependent in the home of her nearest male relative pitied because she never had a chance regarded with contempt as one of the world's derelicts she was condemned to a life of involuntary service and the fact that she legally possessed property enough to ensure her independence did not greatly alter her status in the church then a far greater power in the making of opinion than now women with few exceptions were not allowed to preach sing pray testify or vote during church services women were seated upon one side and men upon the other in order that men may commend themselves to god without interruption it was indelicate for a woman to appear upon a business street without a male escort or to go to a bank to transact business and any woman seen unattended upon the street after dark was regarded with suspicion no college in the world admitted women and there were no high schools for girls 
it was the universal belief that greek and higher mathematics then the two chief cornerstones of the collegiate curriculum were utterly beyond the capacity of women convents and boarding-schools wherein girls of wealth were educated taught nothing more than the rudiments of learning with so-called accomplishments the daughters of the poor received no education at all the recital of the legal and social disabilities of women at the beginning of the nineteenth century is shocking to modern thought but it conveys only a partial understanding of the timid self-distrustful untrained character of the average woman of the day taught that it was unwomanly to hold opinions upon serious subjects that men most admired clinging weakness in women and that woman's one worthy ambition was to secure men's admiration it is no wonder that women made little effort to think for themselves an english book which appeared at this time dr gregory's legacy to my daughters and which was much read on both sides of the atlantic and recommended by the clergy as expressing the correct attitude for women said if you happen to have any learning keep it a profound secret especially from men who look with a jealous malignant eye on a woman of great parts and a cultivated understanding the author counselled girls not to dance with spirit when gaiety of heart would make them feel eloquent lest men who beheld them might either suppose that they were not entirely dependent on their protection for their safety or entertain dark suspicions as to their modesty the philosophy of jean jacques rousseau which had largely influenced the thought of france during the closing years of the eighteenth century was still representative of thought and feeling in the beginning of the nineteenth with regard to women rousseau had said the education of women should always be relative to that of man to please us to be useful to us to make us love and esteem them to educate us when young to take care of us when grown up to advise to console us to render our lives easy and agreeable these are the duties of women at all times and what they should be taught from their infancy in reply the vindication of women was wrung from mary wollstonecraft her eloquent appeal for larger opportunities for women was received in the hostile spirit with which the world receives all new ideas and horace walpole doubtless reflected public opinion when he called her a hyena in petticoats in the western world there were more robust signs of coming change mistress brent a relative of lord baltimore and the owner of a vast estate in maryland not only demanded a voice in the state assembly composed of landholders but defended her contention with so much spirit and logic as to create a lively if unsuccessful debate in that body and all of its constituencies in march seventeen seventy six abigail adams wrote her husband when he was sitting with the continental congress i long to hear you have declared an independency and by the way in the new code of laws which i suppose it will be necessary for you to make i desire you would remember the ladies and be more favorable to them than your ancestors do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands remember all men would be tyrants if they could if particular care and attention are not paid to the ladies we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound to obey any laws in which we have no voice or representation in new jersey tax-paying women were granted the vote by the constitution of july second seventeen seventy six two days before the declaration of independence was declared in seventeen ninety and seventeen ninety seven legislative enactments confirmed them in the right the vote was taken from them by the legislature in eighteen o seven and the explanation was that although qualified women had used the vote quite generally they had not supported the right candidates in the election the legislators therefore sought and won a party advantage by the disfranchisement of electors who had voted against them it was upon such signs and portents that the curtain of the nineteenth century rose the century which the prophetic voice of victor hugo proclaimed the century of women 
of special significance were the indications of a definite movement in the united states for education for girls school districts taxed their own residents for the maintenance of schools as it cost more to build schoolhouses large enough for both boys and girls than for boys alone the discussion was at once precipitated as to whether schools for she's should be maintained the liberal-minded contending for them and the conservative and ungenerous against them many districts compromised by permitting girls to attend school in summer months when boys vacated seats to work on the farms in boston from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen twenty two girls were allowed to attend the public schools under this rule although for a portion of the time an exception was made and they were admitted for two hours in the afternoon after the boys had gone home in eighteen twenty six boston amid a storm of opposition opened a high school for girls but yielded to hostile clamor and closed it in eighteen twenty eight it had been an alarming success the school had been full and not a girl had quitted it in the eighteen months of its existence in spite of the persecution of doubters the discussion of educational opportunity for women received a fresh impulse when it was proposed to include geography in the instruction of girls the proper schedule for girls was held to be confined in the three r's readin writin and arithmetic with some knowledge of a fourth r religion so a battle royal was fought around geography girls whose parents approved the innovation were chased from the schoolhouse to their homes by bands of rollicking boys throwing dirt stones or snowballs and shouting in tones of derision geography girl geography girl there goes a geography girl it was not uncommon for a teacher to give private instruction to girls after school hours and consequent dame schools for girls that is teaching by women in their own homes sprang up in all parts of the country in response to the demand in time women began teaching in country districts during summer months when schools were small one dollar a week and boarding round being considered good terms for such teachers in eighteen twenty one the troy female seminary was opened by mrs emma willard the first institution in the united states offering higher education to women it became an immediate storm centre of abuse the complainants charged that time was wasted in teaching girls two subjects utterly nonsensical for them to know physiology and mathematics a struggle similar to that which brought geography into the lists of subjects permissible for a girl's education was next waged around physiology as late as eighteen forty four when an exceedingly gifted woman paulina wright davis attempted to lecture on physiology and used a mannequin for illustration she reported that so indelicate was the theme considered that women frequently dropped their veils ran out of the room or even fainted mary gore nichols another gifted woman also gave lectures on anatomy and received similar condemnation for the indelicacy of the act a graduate of troy seminary gave evidence in after years of the custom inaugurated during the controversy of pasting thick paper over illustrations of the human body in textbooks on physiology in order that the modesty of young girls might not be shocked the graduates of mrs emma willard's school seem to have felt the responsibility of extending the study of physiology for they introduced it later into their own schools yet several reported that visiting mothers on examination day left the room in a body when the examination in physiology was called of two clergymen visitors at the willard school one was as incensed as the other at the unwarranted attempt to teach girls higher mathematics but their reasons were different one contended that as the female mind was incapable of comprehending mathematics any effort to teach it to girls was opposing nature and god's will the other declared as vehemently that young women might become so enamoured of mathematics that they would employ all their time in solving abstruse problems in algebra and geometry to the exclusion of proper attention to husband and babies 
thus popular ideas concerning education for girls slowly evolved from the zero point of no education to the acknowledgment of a girl's right to acquaintance with the four r's to be gained in free public primary schools from the four r's to the inclusion of geography from geography to physiology from physiology to higher mathematics in high schools each new step being an outpost around which intolerant and bitter controversy raged after eighteen hundred the legal disabilities of women also began to receive attention in eighteen o nine connecticut gave married women the right to make a will from that date legislative changes concerning the civil status of women were frequent southern states deserve the honor of a share in the leadership of the advanced legislation the first of all states to grant the married woman the right of control of her own property was mississippi the third state to give married women the right to make a will was texas eighteen forty the fourth alabama eighteen forty three and the first suffrage for women in the united states after new jersey was the school suffrage granted by kentucky to widows with children in eighteen thirty eight possibly the most permanent factor in giving impulse to the woman movement came with the announced and undisputed discovery by von baer a german scientist that the protoplasm of the ovule the reproductive cell of the maternal organism contributed at least half to the structure of the embryo child before that date it had been held that the mother had no essential share in the formation of the child the comparison being usual that man was the seed and woman the soil the proof of at least equal physical responsibility of parents opened the question of the extent of the mental and moral responsibility resting upon the mother and by degrees this reversal of theory concerning fatherhood and motherhood changed the attitude of educated men toward all phases of the woman question at about this date margaret fuller upset the conventions of the staid city of boston by sitting down at a table in a public library to read a book meanwhile two great reforms were rapidly pressing forward propelled by the controversy of earnest concentrated protagonists on the one hand and bitter hostile antagonists on the other the anti-slavery and anti-liquor movements both appealed strongly to the humanitarian sympathies of the better educated women whether the effort of women had any appreciable effect upon either movement between eighteen hundred and eighteen fifty may be doubted but it is certain that these reforms furnished the most impelling motive that led women to come forth from their seclusion to take part in public affairs they came timidly at first but with the discovery that the majority of men not only did not want their help but expressed their antagonism in phrases and tones of bitter contempt the spirit of many was stung into resentment they chafed at the restraint of individual liberty and the bravest boldly defended the right of any woman to give service to any cause and in any manner she chose the controversy by degrees inevitably spread to all movements churches and philanthropic societies in eighteen thirty three oberlin college in ohio was opened admitting boys and girls black and white on equal terms it was the first college in the world of modern times to admit women but as the feeling of hostility against negro rights was even more intense than that against women's rights the advantage won was lightly regarded by the nation the negroes too shared the common view concerning women and when colored students unfitted to enter the college were organized into preparatory classes they rebelled against being taught by lucy stone one of the earliest students after being persuaded that it would be better to receive education from a woman than not to have it at all they resigned themselves to destiny and became eventually her loyal supporters even saving her at one time from the savage threats of a mob two courageous and remarkable women the grimke sisters of south carolina had freed their slaves in eighteen twenty eight and gone north they began speaking publicly in favor of abolition and were mobbed many times they contended for the rights of women as well as of the slaves 
abby kelly the most persecuted of all the women who labored in the anti-slavery cause also began speaking at about this time and these three fearless women blazed a trail through a fusillade of rotten eggs brickbats and vile abuse to an acknowledgment of the right of women to speak on public platforms independence hall in philadelphia was torn down and set on fire while angelina grimke was speaking in it in eighteen thirty seven and mobs were frequent incidents in the career of the sisters but they were unafraid many men and women were expelled from their churches for having listened to the pleadings of these women for justice to the negro the persecutions continued for years and only ceased with the triumphant acknowledgment by the public of the right of women to organize speak and work for public causes as an outcome of these events the national female anti-slavery society was formed in eighteen thirty three it is claimed as not only the first organized women's society but also as the first effort of women to effect a political question in 1835, at a meeting of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, auxiliary to the National Society, from six to ten thousand men, many being gentlemen of property and influence, gathered about the hall to demand the adjournment of the meeting, composed of fifteen to twenty women. The mayor appeared and ordered them to adjourn, as he could not guarantee them protection any longer. The society adjourned to the home of its president, and the mob turned on William Lloyd Garrison, who was in his office on the same floor, carried him out, and tore off his coat. The authorities were obliged to place him in jail for safety. What proportion of this intolerance was aimed at the anti-slavery movement, and what at the pro-woman movement, the mob itself probably did not know. Women abolitionists were far from being intimidated by the public attitude. 800 women in New York petitioned Congress for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, a radical act at the time, as it was generally believed that the right to petition was confined to electors. John Quincy Adams, in his famous congressional campaign to establish the right of petition for all, introduced in 1837 several additional anti-slavery petitions from women, the national female anti-slavery convention met in new york that same year the first representative body of women ever convened seventy-two delegates were present it was in eighteen thirty seven too that catherine beecher published an essay on slavery with reference to the duty of american females it was answered by a pastoral letter issued by the general association of the congregational churches of massachusetts in which all attempts of women to do public work were bitterly condemned the letter included the following we appreciate the unostentatious prayers and efforts of women in advancing the cause of religion at home and abroad and in leading religious inquirers to the pastor for instructions but when she assumes the place and tone of man as a public reformer our care and protection of her seem unnecessary we put ourselves in self-defense against her she yields the power which god has given her for protection and her character becomes unnatural we say these things not to discourage proper influence against sin but to secure such reformation as we believe is scriptural in that unveiled resentment that male protection of the female should be found unnecessary in that threat of self-defense lies the world-old revelation of man's naive need to appear strong in his own eyes even if he can do so only by making woman appear weak the women doing public work at that time promptly took issue with the letter sarah grimke in spirited defense of her sex said the business of men and women who are ordained by god to preach the unsearchable riches of christ to a lost and perishing world is to lead souls to christ and not to pastors for instruction john greenleaf whittier poured out his indignation and maria weston chapman her amusement in verse which travelled far sarah grimke threw a bomb into the established views of society when in vigorous english she said if sewing societies, 
the fruits of whose industry are now expended in supporting and educating young men for the ministry were to withdraw their contributions to these objects and give them where they are needed to the advancement of their own sex in useful learning the next generation might furnish sufficient proof that in intelligence and ability to master the whole circle of sciences woman is not inferior to man and instead of a sensible woman being regarded as she now is a lapse of nature they would be quite as common as sensible men the controversy raised the woman's rights agitation into general notice and made it a burning question in all abolition societies splitting some of them wide asunder the men's and women's anti-slavery societies united in eighteen thirty nine and a resolution endorsing the work of women in the anti-slavery field was passed but left an embittered minority still unconvinced already many tracts written by women were in useful circulation while the propagandistic effort of the public addresses of the increasing number of women speakers was unquestioned the next year it was proposed in the same society to name abby kelly on a committee whereupon the defeated minority of the year before vented its wrath upon all women workers no question of the value of women's work was raised the opposition to their participation in the work being based upon the claim that they were disobeying god's will the women were sustained by a large majority but two clergymen refused to serve upon the committee with a woman and others left the society in the same year eighteen forty the british anti-slavery societies issued an invitation to all friends of the slave to join in a world's anti-slavery convention to be held in london in july and all american anti-slavery societies were especially urged to send delegates eight women were among those named a stormy debate began in the very first session in which it was vehemently declared that all order would be at an end if promiscuous female representation be allowed and god's clear intention violated the debate will always stand as a landmark showing the world's opinion of the capacities and rights of women at that date it ended by a vote to bar out the women delegates william lloyd garrison and nathaniel p rogers arriving after the convention had taken action refused to take their places as delegates and sat behind the bar with the rejected women lucretia mott delegate and elizabeth cady stanton the wife of a delegate with indignation thoroughly aroused by this experience agreed to call a convention upon their return to the united states to be devoted exclusively to the rights of women thus the unwarranted rejection of properly accredited delegates by the world's anti-slavery convention solely because they were women gave impulse to the organized demand of women the world around for justice in every sphere of action meanwhile women in larger numbers and bolder fashion kept on engaging in public work and in unexpected fields individual women kept on startling the world by achievements generally believed impossible men of vision began to perceive that a powerful movement was under way but few ventured at that date to predict either the direction it would take or its ultimate aim end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Women, Suffrage, and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women, Suffrage, and Politics, The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Chapter 2, The Averted Triumph, 1848-1860. It was not until 1848 that the compact made in 1840 by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to call a women's rights convention was carried out. Mrs. Mott was occupied with religious and reform obligations, Mrs. Stanton with a family of young children. The project was revived while Mrs. Mott was visiting her sister, Martha C. Wright, in Seneca Falls, New York, where Mrs. Stanton also had become a resident. 
Action followed so shortly upon the decision to call a convention that the news had not spread throughout the neighborhood when an astonished public read a notice in the town paper on July 14 that a woman's rights convention would be held in the Wesleyan Chapel on the 19th and 20th of the month. The program of the first day, as announced, was to be exclusively for women, and of the second day for the general public, when Lucretia Mott and others would speak. The call was unsigned. The five days intervening were busy ones for the four sponsors, Mrs. Lucretia Mott, Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Mrs. Ann McClintock, and Mrs. Martha C. Wright. Having called the convention, they set themselves at work to compose a program and policy for it. In the McClintock parlor, around a small table now in the Smithsonian Institution, they discussed women's wrongs and how to lay them before the world in orderly fashion until finally they hit upon the happy idea of framing their grievances against the nation in imitation of the Declaration of Independence. Finding as many grievances against the government of men as the colonists had against the government of King George, they promptly drew up the Declaration of Women's Rights, fortified by this document and four speeches for each of the four had prepared one, they were on hand at the appointed hour. Although the hurried and timid call had not been heard far away, the small chapel was filled. At first the women were disconcerted to find that men had not taken their exclusion seriously and were present in considerable numbers, but when they reflected that no woman had ever presided over a convention, they welcomed the men cordially and elected one of them, James Mott, chairman. The declaration was adopted. It named as the first of the grievances the denial of the elective franchise, and it was signed by one hundred men and women. So inadequate did the two days prove for the discussion of a subject so extensive that the convention adjourned to meet in Rochester two weeks later. There the declaration was again adopted and signed by large numbers of influential men and women. These two conventions had in no sense been national in scope, but newspapers throughout the country regarded them as an innovation worthy of comment and full press accounts were carried far and wide. Preceding events had prepared the country for controversy centered upon the subject of women's rights, apart from the anti-slavery and temperance causes, and a widespread discussion for and against the long list of liberties claimed, inaugurated by the two conventions. Never in all history did so small a beginning produce so great an effect in so short a time. Emily P. Collins immediately formed a local suffrage society at South Bristol, New York, the first in the world, and the Baby Club, wasting no time, sent a woman's suffrage petition to the New York legislature in January 1849 with 62 signatures. Encouraged by the knowledge that other women were rising, organized groups sprang into being in all parts of the country with no other incentive than the ripeness of the time and no other connection with the original movers than the announcements of the press. Meantime, year by year and state by state, the legal disabilities of women had been yielding to attention. Between 1844 and 1848, the legislatures of Maine, Mississippi, New York, and Pennsylvania, in the order named, granted property rights to women. The right to make a will had been granted in some states. In the educational realm, the graduation of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell from the Geneva Medical College made a tremendous signpost for the year 1848. Public hostility to her course may be measured by the fact that the women at her boarding house refused to speak to her during her three years of study. On the streets, they drew aside their skirts if they chanced to meet her, lest they be contaminated by contact. The controversy created by the events of the year were excited and widespread. Clergymen were alarmed and very generally denounced the masculine, strong-minded women who were attempting to drive men from their God-ordained sphere. The press took sides and contributed, as usual, both understanding and confusion to the discussion. From that date, some new wonder was continually emanating from the women's camp to give fresh impulse and direction to the agitation. Three young women had been graduated from Oberlin in 1841, and each year brought the announcement of more graduates. Women were lecturing in all parts of the country on slavery, temperance, physiology, and women's rights, 
and were drawing and edifying large audiences. The most reckless escape from traditional discipline occurred in 1846, when the licensed law, having been repealed in New York, women alone or in groups entered saloons, breaking windows, glasses, bottles, and emptying demijohns and barrels into the streets. Coming like whirlwinds of vengeance, drunkards and rum sellers stood paralyzed before them. Footnote. History of Woman Suffrage, Volume 1, page 475. End of footnote. These episodes continued spasmodically for some years. A lively total abstinence movement conducted by men had been in progress for 50 years, and out of it had grown the demand for various reforms, including legalized prohibition. Women circulated and presented petitions to town councils and the legislatures, asking revision of liquor laws. What was called the wave of temperance excitement passed over the country in 1852 through 1855, beginning in Maine, which passed a prohibition law. In 1840, the sons of temperance were organized, and the daughters of temperance quickly followed. Argument on women's place in human society was passing from the anti-slavery to the temperance societies. The Sons of Temperance, meeting at Albany in 1852, gallantly admitted delegates from the Daughters of Temperance, but when one of them, Susan B. Anthony, arose to speak to a motion, the chairman informed her that the sisters were not invited there to speak, but to listen and learn, a fact which led the women to withdraw and form the Women's State Temperance Society, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton as president and Susan B. Anthony as secretary. It held important meetings during the next two years and was addressed by many distinguished men and women. The example set by New York was followed in other states and several similar societies came into existence. Later in the same year, a New York State Temperance Convention was held in Syracuse. Susan B. Anthony and Amelia Bloomer accredited delegates from the Women's State Temperance Society were refused admission after a debate described as a perfect pandemonium, the women had an unintentional revenge. A liberal clergyman publicly offered his church for a meeting and announced that the two rejected delegates would speak there, whereupon the convention was deserted and the church was packed. In 1853, the Friends of Temperance met in New York at the Brick Church to arrange for a World's Temperance Convention. Women delegates were present and were accepted by a vote. The motion was made that Susan B. Anthony should be added to the business committee, whereupon a discussion arose upon the right of women to such posts. The discussion was marked by the usual vituperation and insult and ended by the appointment of a committee to decide the matter. The committee recommended that the women be excluded from the convention and the report was adopted. Thomas Wentworth Higginson at once requested all persons who wished to call a whole World's Temperance Convention to meet elsewhere. The ten women delegates and a number of liberal-minded men left the room. After their departure, a further discussion followed, condemning all public action of women. One reverend gentleman expressing pleasure at being now rid of the scum of the convention. It therefore happened that there were two World's Temperance Conventions held in New York in September, one arranged and attended by men and women, and the other held under the auspices of the Brick Church meeting. Antoinette Brown was sent by two societies to the last-named convention. The Credential Committee omitted her name from the list of delegates, whereupon it was moved that she should be admitted. A furious discussion followed in which every phrase of the women's rights movement was given attention. The discussion covered the greater part of two days, ending in a vote upon the question. By a small majority, Miss Brown was admitted. It was then moved and carried by the same majority that she be given ten minutes in which to address the convention. She came to the platform cheered by, Take courage, from Wendell Phillips, and a God bless you, from Reverend William Henry Channing. The minority, however, were not to be overcome so easily. She was greeted with sneers, hisses, shouting, and stamping. The confusion, appropriate only to a mob, continued for three hours, at which time the convention adjourned. During this period, the courageous young woman stood firm and unshaken, although the fingers of men from all over the house were pointing at her and shouts of, Shame on the woman! assailed her continually. When asked why she went to the convention, she replied, I ask no favor as a woman or in behalf of women, 
No favor as a woman advocating temperance, no recognition of the cause of a woman above the cause of humanity, the endorsement of no issue and of no measure. But I claimed, in the name of the world, the rights of a delegate in a world's convention. A clergyman, nearly all the delegates were clergymen, were asked why the convention acted as it did, replied that it was the principle of the thing. Practically the whole time of this world's convention was expended in rude and quarrelsome discussion over the question of permitting women to speak and work for temperance. An Ohio woman's temperance convention was called in Dayton the same year. The sons of temperance permitted the use of their hall, provided no men were admitted to their meeting. No sooner had the first session opened than a column of well-dressed ladies, very fashionable and precise, marched in two and two and spread themselves in a half-circle in front of the platform, requesting to be heard. Permission being granted, they informed the delegates that they had come to read a remonstrance against the unseemly and unchristian position assumed by women who called conventions taking places on platforms and seeking notoriety by making yourselves conspicuous before men. They condemned the disgraceful conduct of Antoinette Brown at the New York Convention and, having presented their views, turned and walked out. The convention went right on. The right of women to work for temperance was now a dominating question of the temperance movement, as a decade before it had been a mooted question of the abolition movement. The conflict over women's rights, however, was by no means confined to these two great reforms. The same year, Susan B. Anthony attended the New York Teachers' Convention in Rochester. Although a member on equal footing with others, she caused a sensation by rising to speak to the question. Why the profession of teacher was not as much respected as that of minister, lawyer, or doctor, which had been discussed for some hours. It had been the custom in these conventions for men to discuss all notions and to vote upon them, although women composed a large portion of the membership. At length, President Davis of West Point, in full dress, buff vest, blue coat, gilt buttons, stepped to the front and said, in tremulous mocking tone, what would the lady have? I wish, sir, to speak to the question under discussion, Miss Anthony replied. The professor, still more perplexed, said, What is the pleasure of the convention? A gentleman moved that she should be heard. Another seconded the motion, wherefore a discussion pro and con followed, lasting fully half an hour, when a vote of the men only was taken and permission granted by a small majority. Footnote. History of Women's Suffrage, Volume 1, page 515, end of footnote. Miss Anthony arose and said, Do you not see, gentlemen, that so long as society says a woman is incompetent to be a lawyer, minister, or doctor, but has ample ability to be a teacher, that every man of you who chooses this profession tacitly acknowledges that he has no more brains than a woman? For this speech, she was bitterly denounced by nearly all the men and women present. But the next morning's Rochester Democrats said, Whatever the schoolmasters may think of Miss Anthony, it is evident that she hit the nail on the head. While much discussion within other organizations was centering upon women's rights, the movement was rapidly solidifying into an organization of its own. The first National Women's Rights Convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts, October 1850. Unlike that of 1848, which was not heralded as national, it was carefully arranged and well advertised. The call was signed by 89 prominent men and women. Eleven states were represented at the convention, which provided for another the following year. The importance of the persons connected with it and the high tone of all its deliberations secured widespread comment. A report of the convention reaching England, Mrs. Taylor, afterwards Mrs. John Stuart Mill, sent an account to the Westminster Review, from which dates the organized women suffrage movement in England. From 1850 to 1860, a national suffrage convention was held in the United States each year, with one exception. Footnote. 1850 and 1851 Worcester, 1852 Syracuse, 1853 Cleveland, 1854 Philadelphia, 1855 Cincinnati, 
1856 New York, 1857 none, 1858, 1859, and 1860 New York. End of footnote. State conventions attended by some of the leading spirits were held in Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, out of which grew state organizations with local auxiliaries. Indiana boasts the first state organization. The New York Convention of 1853 was afterwards called the Mob Convention. The week had begun with an anti-slavery meeting, opened on Sunday morning when Antoinette Brown addressed 5,000 people, and the fact that she had done so called out the denunciation of the religious press. During the week, many meetings devoted to reforms were held, public condemnation growing in hostility until it broke in rampant violence upon the suffrage issue, which was last of the series. The mob was present at every session and met each motion and each speaker with hisses, yells, and stamping of feet. The suffragists themselves said that, owing to the turmoil, we have no fair report of the proceedings, and even the representatives of the press could not catch what was said. The contrasting comment on the convention was well represented by the Tribune and the Herald. Said the Tribune, Horace Greeley, September 7, 1853, It was never so transparent that a hiss or a blackguard yell was the only answer that the case admitted of, and when Lucy Stone closed the discussion with some pungent yet pathetic remarks on the sort of opposition that had been manifest, it was evident that if any of the rowdies had had an ant hole in the bottom of his boot, he would inevitably have sunk through it and disappeared forever. Said the Herald, James Gordon Bennett, September 7, 1853, The assemblage of rampant women which convened at their tabernacle yesterday was an interesting phase in the comic history of the 19th century. A gathering of unsexed women, unsexed in mind, all of them publicly propounding the doctrine that they should be allowed to step out of their appropriate sphere to the neglect of those duties which both human and divine law have assigned them, is the world to be depopulated? There was one immediate redeeming feature of the occasion for, at 25 cents per admission, the mob had not only paid the entire expenses of the convention, but it had left a surplus in the treasury with which to continue suffrage work. Footnote. History of Woman Suffrage, Volume 1, page 567. End of footnote. The experiences of that week had not intimidated the women, but had instead stirred their minds to clear conviction, and united their hands to more constructive action. Mobs seem a divine instrument for the furtherance of good causes. No mob ever destroyed an idea. Many a mob has given one a fresh impulse, and this one sent every delegate home with her soul afire. Lucy Stone, silver-voiced, gentle to look upon, but with the courage of a lioness, had graduated from Oberlin in 1847 and started forth single-handed and alone to conquer the world for women's rights. She now went through Massachusetts from town to town engaging the town hall, nailing up her own advertising and conducting her own meetings. Her auditors came to scorn and went away to praise. The press gave her such titles as She Hyena, the clergy thundered at her, the average man and woman regarded her as a freak, but the liberal-minded listened and endorsed. In time, she formed committees to carry the work forward. From Massachusetts as a center, lecturing and organizing spread all over New England, and in 1854, a New England convention was held in Boston and became an annual feature of the May anniversaries for 60 years thereafter. In the period from August 1854 to 1855, Miss Anthony had held meetings in 54 of the 61 counties of New York and conventions at Saratoga, then a favorite summer resort of the leisurely well-to-do, had already become an established and exceedingly popular feature. In 1854, the first convention designed to influence suffrage legislative action was held in Albany, and petitions of 10,000 names asking for woman suffrage were presented from two counties alone, Onondaga and Warren. Mrs. Stanton addressed the legislature with so masterly a speech that the legislators pronounced it unanswerable. In 1856, legislative committees in Ohio and Wisconsin reported favorably. Right to suffrage bills recommended that they do pass, and legislators in many other states publicly pronounced their conversion. Lecture courses were organized in many states by these women in which slavery 
temperance and women's rights were presented, the speakers endorsing all three. Theodore Parker, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, George William Curtis, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Ward Beecher were among those who spoke. After one convention, Grace Greenwood, a distinguished writer, said, Lucretia Mott may be said to be the soul of this movement, and Mrs. Stanton the mind, the swift, keen intelligence. Miss Anthony, alert, aggressive, and indefatigable, is its nervous energy, its propulsive force. All three were at work, lecturing, inspiring, organizing, planning, raising money. There were many others, Paulina Wright Davis, Ernestine L. Rose, Clarinda I. Nichols, Lucy Stone, Francis D. Gage, Hannah Trace Cutler, all able advocates of the cause. On the anti-slavery and temperance platform, still other women were speaking and giving sledgehammer blows at the old prejudices. There were few towns of consequence which were not reached by one or more of these resolute souls in the North and West. One by one, the states were fast amending the women's laws, Wisconsin, California, Minnesota, Oregon, and Kansas, coming into statehood during this period, began with liberal codes of law for women, and their example proved so infectious that no new state thereafter went back to the old legal sources for its guidance concerning women. At the 10th Annual National Suffrage Convention held in New York, May 1860, Miss Anthony, chairman of the Finance Committee, made an elaborate report and announced that the press has changed its tone. Instead of ridicule, we now have grave debate. She reported the many legal changes already made, the aroused and sympathetic public opinion, and predicted that New York would enfranchise its women when it revises its constitution six years hence. Already, said she, the state had been thoroughly canvassed and every county visited by lecturers and tracts and petitions by the hundreds of thousands have been sent to the legislature asking for the right to vote, the right to her person, her wages, her children. During the past year, we have had six women lecturing in New York for several months each. Conventions have been held in 40 counties and one or more lectures delivered in 150 towns and villages. Many bills for women's rights had by now been passed by state legislatures including women's right to their earnings, their property, and their children. Men of prominence in large numbers had publicly espoused the cause, and hope for continued triumph of the movement was exuberant. No cause ever made such rapid strides as that of women's rights from 1850 to 1860. Women had proved their value as reform propagandists, and apparently all the leaders of the abolition and temperance movements were at length united in recognizing that fact and all espouse their cause. The more reflection I give, the more my mind becomes convinced that in a Republican government we have no right to deny to woman the privilege she claims, wrote a member of the New York legislature, and his views were reported by suffrage workers as becoming common. Anti-slavery and anti-liquor had fought their way to the center of the nation's thought and women's rights had sprung from the two full-armed and exceeded both in legislative concession. Jubilant with success, despite the hard work and unhappy experiences of the early days, suffragists pushed on expectantly. The goal was in sight. The race was all but run. Few of this generation, even among suffragists, realized how close to victory were the women of that earlier suffrage crisis. Through disrepute and abuse and mob violence, they had brought the woman suffrage question out upon a new plane. The rotten eggs, the jeers, the hisses, and vile epithets of the beginning were bygones. Able and widely influential men had come to the support of the suffrage cause. Suffrage meetings wherever held were calling forth enthusiastic crowds and favorable reports by the press with editorials pro and con. The whole world had grown friendly and tolerant. In political interest, women's suffrage was ranking second only to the question of slavery. Both were fairly up to the doors of the National Congress. Had the nation moved forward in the mood of those times, women assuredly would have been enfranchised soon, consistently with the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the liberal progressive spirit which inspired the period. Alas, before the date for the next annual suffrage convention, 
the nation was plunged into the tragic depths of civil war over the slavery issue, and thereafter, woman's suffrage was so hopelessly enmeshed in the politics of the Negro question as to be inextricable for long years to come. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. That Adjective Male. 1866. Before the Civil War, there was no movement in the United States to secure Negro suffrage. Of the 37 states which composed the Union at the time of the ratification of the 15th Amendment, all save six used the word white as descriptive of the elector. Five of the six were in new england and the sixth was kansas the war aftermath presented two imperative and difficult problems which demanded immediate attention one the reinstatement of the seceding states in the union the other the determination of the status of the negro both led inevitably to the discussion of questions involved in the right to vote representation in congress had been apportioned to the southern states by the federal constitution article one section two according to the number of free persons plus three-fifths of all other persons meaning slaves it was clear that no such apportionment could continue slaves within the seceding states had been freed by the emancipation proclamation issued by president lincoln as a military emergency january one eighteen sixty three some months before the close of the war the thirteenth amendment to the federal constitution forever abolishing slavery throughout the entire union was submitted to the several legislatures and was proclaimed as ratified december eighteenth eighteen sixty five some months after the close of the war footnote thirteenth amendment section one neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been convicted shall exist within the united states or any place subject to their jurisdiction section two congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation in the footnote the congress then asked itself what is now the status of the negro and answered its own question in lengthy debate the crux of which was that he is no longer a chattel but although a free man he is neither alien nor citizen the republican party the party that had won the war and freed the slaves felt keenly that the negro was a charge upon it many proposals were offered in that congress for the settlement of these two momentous problems each involving almost endless subsidiary controversies each proposal was defended and opposed by earnest sincere groups and into every discussion the question shall the negro be enfranchised injected itself in no time since the convention which drafted the declaration of independence had political debate reached so high a level the rights of man had again come into the foreground of the nation's chief consideration the principles of human rights were quoted analyzed and applied rights freedom liberty and most frequently of all the consent of the governed 
were the expressions which marked the trend of the debate the northern victors were in a forgiving and magnanimous mood the nation's orators painted fascinating pictures of a restored and contented nation with slavery abolished with full and complete justice given all races classes and both sexes and with a patriotic unity of service for the common welfare to be sure the details were blurred or wanting but the picture was heartening and inspiring despite the oppressively high cost of living the looming burden of taxes and the many homes of mourning a comforting belief was widespread that great and amazing good had come to the nation out of the terrible suffering and sacrifices of the war a very definite impulse to extend to all a far greater need of justice than the world had yet dreamed possible seized the people they were inspired to this end by the great men upon whose leadership the country had learned to rely with confidence negroes were justified in trusting for protection to the party that had freed them nor was it to be altogether a concession of the strong to the weak for during the war a quarter of a million black men had been enlisted and trained for the union army women were equally justified in the hope that the lofty expressions of sentiment and frank admissions of gratitude for their war sacrifices would be written into law they too had not only served in the hour of danger but their services had frequently been decisive in character as in all modern war women had quietly taken the places of men in stores shops factories and fields and kept the nation's needs supplied by their unremitting although often unskilled toil dr elizabeth blackwell returning to the united states from england where she had engaged in practice had organized the scattered efforts of women into a nationwide constructive force this had been accomplished in june eighteen sixty one under the name of the sanitary commission which was placed under government authority scraping lint making bandages packing boxes and gathering materials to go to the front had absorbed the time of thousands of women the organization had been supported entirely by women's work and during the war had raised ninety-two millions of dollars to aid in the care of the sick and wounded of the army it was the forerunner of the red cross and its work was so much more thoroughly done than anything before attempted by women as to call forth expressions of astonishment from foreign observers while the sanitary commission had been supporting the union the women of the south had been as devotedly and ably supporting their side of the nation's controversy nurses in the army hospitals north and south knew no respite and gave all the possibilities of their strength to temper the suffering of the wounded men nor had the war work of women been confined to these usual feminine services during the early years of the war a constant demand had been made by the abolitionists for the emancipation of the slaves the replies of president lincoln indicating that the country had given no mandate for such an act mrs elizabeth cady stanton and susan b anthony the woman suffrage leaders organized a national loyal league and set themselves the task of supplying that mandate when senator charles sumner presented the first installment one hundred thousand signatures he said i offer a petition now lying on the desk before me it is too bulky for me to take up i need not add that it is too bulky for any of the pages of this body to carry the petition eventually presented to congress numbered three hundred thousand signers and was acknowledged by president lincoln and members of congress as furnishing an authoritative public demand for the emancipation proclamation the civil war developed military heroines too though the greatest of them died unacknowledged by her nation anna ella carroll 
proposed urged and finally persuaded the military authorities to substitute the tennessee river for the mississippi as the base of operation and this strategy was generally admitted as having more speedily won the war colonel scott assistant secretary of war pressed upon judge evans a friend of miss carroll the necessity of keeping the origin of the tennessee campaign a secret while the struggle lasted men of high positions and military affairs of the government including president lincoln also made it clear to miss carroll that it would be dangerous to success to make known the fact that the government was proceeding under the advice of a civilian and especially a woman civilian the war over the story leaked out but before a demand was made for congressional recognition of her service death had claimed those who knew it best women had also participated in the civic and political life of the nation in ways hitherto unknown women for the first time were appointed during the war to positions in federal departments of government and filled them with credit the freedmen's bureau upon which congress first tried to build the reconstruction measures was the idea of mrs josephine griffin in the second lincoln election there was grave anxiety on the part of republicans as to the outcome since loyal voters were at the front then anna dickinson entered the campaign young eloquent and soul-stirring speaking as if her lips had been touched with a live coal from the altars of heaven numerous republican leaders gave her frank credit for having turned some of the doubtful states and the climax of the men's gratitude in the midst of this early after-war period so pregnant with hope for the future wherein speeches interviews and press articles were common and fulsome in praise of the unexpected but admittedly decisive help that women had given to the civil war susan b anthony was visiting her brother in leavenworth kansas one day while quietly perusing the morning paper she received a shock she read that a proposal had been made to introduce the word male into a forthcoming amendment to the federal constitution the thirteenth amendment was not yet ratified another amendment was predicted what form it might take no one knew yet she was quick to see that if this phrasing went into it it would stamp women as a definitely disfranchised class throughout the land and degrade them to a political status inferior to the one they then occupied still wearied from the constant toil and anxiety of war work she waited to learn no more but hastened at once to her home in rochester new york stopping at several points on the way to confer with men and women who before the war had been sincere champions of the cause of woman suffrage nowhere did she find encouragement that the earlier zeal for women's rights could be revived but her intrepid soul was undaunted she arrived at her home september twenty three eighteen sixty five and the next morning began a campaign that was not to end until a proclamation announced the ratification of a woman suffrage federal amendment fifty-five years later she visited every town where before the war there had been an influential group who stood for women's rights held meetings aroused old friends and inspired new ones into activity secured favorable press comment and everywhere started the circulation of petitions to congress when congress convened on december four petitions were already arriving protesting against the introduction into the constitution of the word male few senators or representatives escaped a bombardment of letters and petitions urging that the nation should take no such backward step as to write the word male into the constitution throughout the winter the congressional debate in washington continued often much jumbled and wandering far afield but with the fourteenth amendment very slowly and very definitely emerging from the chaos of thought as the final congressional deduction miss anthony without respite travelled planned and aroused mrs stanton wrote and inspired and the women at home sought signers to the petitions which poured into the congress incessantly groups of women watching and working followed the debate from every great centre of population and higher and higher 
rose the justifiable expectation that the noble expressions of faith in the just application of sacred american principles made by congressmen party officials and leaders of popular thought were to be written into law the climax of hope was reached when senator charles sumner long a tried and supposedly true friend of the woman's cause delivered a speech which literally rang around the world equal rights for all was the theme and every possible plea for the ballot was reviewed unanswerably eloquently and passionately indeed in after years he replied to an appeal for a message on woman suffrage as follows take that address said he substitute sex for colour and you have the best speech i could make on your platform the great speech did not definitely mention women but no word excluded them and those who believed he meant all when he said so found in it nothing to shake their faith a few days later while the noble and stirring appeal of this address was still ringing in their ears each watching group of women was chilled to the soul with the apprehension of coming disaster senator sumner in presenting a petition for suffrage for women constituents led by lydia maria child one of the most gifted and cultured women in the land apologized for it as untimely and injudicious that this advocate of equal rights for all and long-time defender of woman's rights would repudiate the women's claims at the first opportunity to translate theory into reality was an outcome no woman had suspected did his defection signify apostasy of other friends the women asked each other in alarm and worked the harder to avert that possibility in may eighteen sixty six the first woman's rights convention since that of may eighteen sixty was held in new york suffrage forces had been reorganized and new recruits had taken the places of defection at the opening of the convention resolutions were adopted calculated to fix the purpose of the convention which was to plead with congress to consider suffrage for women as a question of immediate importance and if nothing more could be achieved to protest against putting the word male in the constitution as defining electors twice resolutions were passed and delivered to congress fortifying the appeals that were being sent in by petition an address to congress prepared by miss anthony was also read adopted and later laid upon the desk of every senator and representative in part miss anthony said men and parties must pass away but justice is eternal and they only who work in harmony with its laws are immortal all who have carefully noted the proceedings of this congress and contrasted your speeches with those made under the old regime of slavery must have seen the added power and eloquence that greater freedom gives but still you proposed no action on your grand ideas your joint resolutions your reconstruction reports do not reflect your highest thought the constitution in basing representation on respective numbers covers a broader ground than any you have yet proposed but the only tenable ground of representation is universal suffrage as it is only through universal suffrage that the principle of equal rights to all can be realized with you we have just passed through the agony of death the resurrection and triumph of another revolution doing all in our power to mitigate its horrors and gild its glories and now think you we have no souls to fire no brains to weigh your arguments that after education such as this we can stand silent witnesses while you sell our birthright of liberty our demand must ever be no compromise of human rights no admission in the constitution of inequality of rights or disfranchisement on account of color or sex three conspicuous figures upon the program at this convention were theodore tilton henry ward beecher and wendell phillips there were no men who exercised a more compelling political leadership than they at that moment no voices in the land were so eloquent as those of beecher and phillips and their influence was enormous with the people with congress and the republican party in the light of what happened afterwards their speeches were fraught with historic significance said henry ward beecher i can scarcely express my sense of the leap the public mind and the public moral sense have taken within this time the barrier is out of the way 
slavery abolished that which made the american mind untrue logically to itself is smitten down by the hand of god and there is just at this time an immense tendency in the public mind to carry out all principles to their legitimate conclusions go where they will there never was a time when men were so practical and so ready to learn i am not a farmer but i know that the spring comes but once a year when the furrow is open is the time to put in your seed if you would gather a harvest in its season now when the red-hot ploughshare of war has opened a furrow in this nation is the time to put in the seed if any man says to me why will you agitate the woman question when it is the hour for the black man i answer it is the hour for every man black or white when the public mind is open if you have anything to say say it if you have any radical principles to urge any organizing wisdom to make known don't wait until quiet times come don't wait until the public mind shuts up altogether progress goes by periods by jumps and spurts we are in the favored hour i therefore say whatever truth is to be known for the next fifty years in this nation let it be spoken now i therefore advocate no sectional rights no class rights no sex rights but the most universal form of right for all that live and breathe on the continent i propose that you take expediency out of the way and that you put a principle that is more enduring than expediency in the place of it manhood and womanhood suffrage for all you may just as well meet it now as at any other time you never will have so favourable an occasion so sympathetic a heart never a public reason so willing to be convinced as to-day so far splendid that the speech of wendell phillips sounded alarm anew for the women his had been the staunchest most uncompromising soul among the many great men friends of women's rights now he pleaded with the same culture and eloquence for ultimate justice that always characterized his addresses but he seemed to put the date afar off subtly and skilfully skirting around the practical questions of immediate policies interviews with congressmen begging them to heed the petitions which were pouring in followed the convention the work did not cease until june sixteenth eighteen sixty six when congress submitted the fourteenth amendment it was an omnibus and a compromise amendment covering all the mooted points and contained the word male three times footnote fourteenth amendment section one all persons born or naturalized in the united states and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the united states and of the state wherein they reside no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the united states nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws section two representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers counting the whole number of persons in each state excluding indians not taxed for when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the united states representatives in congress the executive and judicial officers of a state or the members of the legislature thereof is denied to any male inhabitants of such state being twenty-one years of age and citizens of the united states or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens twenty-one years of age in such state section three no person shall be a senator or representative in congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office civil or military under the united states or under any state who having previously taken an oath as a member of congress or as an officer of the united states or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the constitution of the united states shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof but congress may by a vote of two-thirds of each house remove such disability 
section four the validity of the public debt of the united states authorized by law including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion shall not be questioned but neither the united states nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the united states or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave but all such debts obligations and claims shall be held illegal and void section five the congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article End of footnote. nationwide protest was expressed by press and platform said the springfield republican no one can deny that it was a mean thing to put the word male into the fourteenth amendment it was an implied denial of suffrage to women thaddeus stevens author of the amendment and majority leader of the house had based representation upon the number of legal voters in the original draft but conservatives made such vigorous protests that he was forced to introduce the word male these protests were especially vigorous from california oregon and nevada where the possibility of chinese preponderance was feared charles sumner afterwards confessed that he had covered nineteen pages of fool's cap in his effort to formulate the amendment so as to omit the word male the truth was that the congressional mind was much disturbed by the political situation and the popular mind was much divided in opinion the biennial congressional election was approaching and the republican party could not face it with calmness the steadying influence of president lincoln had been removed by his assassination in april and vice president andrew johnson a pro-war democrat had taken his place the president and the congress held incompatible theories of reconstruction a consequent feeling of rancor had arisen which made the next election an appeal to the voters to decide between the president and congress a genuine fear lest president johnson should make connection with democrats north and south and thus produce a party strong enough to overthrow the republicans was entertained by many the reception of the fourteenth amendment was uncertain and the suffrage phase of reconstruction was the particular point where moral courage yielded to political timidity most congressional abolitionists were firm in their conviction that the negro freeman would not be able to protect themselves against their former masters unless they were equipped with the vote their efforts to convert their fellow members were making progress much stimulated by continual rumors of the mistreatment of the negroes in the south but nevada received into statehood eighteen sixty four after the ratification of the thirteenth amendment had audaciously specified a denial of the vote to negroes in her constitution in the autumn of eighteen sixty five negro suffrage had been submitted to popular vote in connecticut wisconsin minnesota the territory of colorado and the district of columbia and had been defeated in all of them although the republicans were in power in them all urgent pleas were hurriedly issued by national leaders of the republican party to those in control of state party organizations to start activities which would hasten the removal of this handicap to national action state party leaders returned excuses for delay in taking further referenda upon the ground that public sentiment was opposed to the entire question leaders in the congress began to sense a baffling struggle ahead the combination of this hesitancy on the part of the north to enfranchise the negro the vexatious conflict between the president and the majority in congress the convincing proof that freedom for the negro was not an accomplished fact in the south tended to increase timidity and conservatism expediency was being rapidly substituted for principle although abolitionists were urging negro suffrage and although several amendments of the fourteenth amendment had been proposed to this effect no endorsement of negro suffrage had yet passed congress every argument which could be made for negro suffrage applied to women there was no escaping that fact the negro was making little demand for the vote the women were making an unprecedented one how to get the negro in and keep the women out constituted an ever-present conundrum the reason for the growing sordidness of attitude was twofold the politician held fast to the idea that if the surrendered states were to be retained in obedient and humble mood the negro with his certain tendency to vote in conjunction with northern ideas 
must be enfranchised the average abolitionist that the negroes must have the vote to protect themselves from their late masters and both politician and reformer united in the conviction that if negro suffrage was ever to come the north must endorse the act which extended it yet the north not only showed no desire to take this step but anti-slavery men were not entirely united as to the wisdom of such demand mr garrison himself though foremost for the abolition of slavery was not quite ready to join this advanced movement the fourteenth amendment merely presented an option to the south to enfranchise the negro or subtract the colored man from the basis of representation it did not confer the vote upon the negro yet it threatened to punish states if they allowed him to remain unenfranchised in after years james g blaine wrote under the strain and anxiety of finding the way to carry the next election and to hold the south in line the outspoken moral courage which a few months before had exalted the nation withered and left the nation wondering doubting and depressed the congress adjourned and entered the campaign of eighteen sixty six with confused misgiving in the common sacrifices made necessary by war the people of all nations are united by sympathetic ties rarely existent at other times the civil war was no exception to the rule and men had sincerely felt and honestly expressed their gratitude to women for the part they had performed but as the victory receded further and further into the past and vexatious problems continually injected themselves in ceaseless procession for solution the gratitude faded the services themselves were forgotten in the next mood the question of the extension of suffrage to either negroes or women made the nerves of politicians tingle and fill them with exasperation End of chapter three chapter four of woman suffrage and politics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics, The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Roger Schuler. The Negro's Hour. The elections of 1866 resulted in an overwhelming victory for the Republicans. The two-thirds vote of both houses needed to override any veto of the president had been returned to Congress, and the northern legislatures had sufficient majorities to ensure the ratification of the 14th Amendment. There still remained the rasping inconsistency which had put the North in the position of thrusting Negro suffrage on the South while it had taken no action on Negro suffrage itself, but the majority in Congress had been rendered bolder by its size and the emphatic expression of public confidence. Moreover, it had been further aroused by the disturbing reports of Negro persecution in the South so it determined upon radical action. A bill was promptly introduced to confer suffrage upon the Negro men of the District of Columbia with the sole qualification of one year's residence. Thereupon, Senator Cohen of Pennsylvania, an extreme conservative and a Democrat, moved to strike out the word male from the bill, thus making the suffrage apply equally to women and Negroes. It took three entire days of debate to dispose of Senator Cohen, he had invariably opposed change of any kind and was accused of insincerity and a desire to hector the Republicans. He confessed that he believed in neither woman suffrage nor Negro suffrage, but Negro suffrage will come, said he, because the majority here is strong enough to bring it. But if I have no reason to offer why a Negro man shall not vote, I have no reason to offer why a white woman shall not vote. He asked Charles Sumner how he would answer the challenge to the United States Senate Quote, when made by women of the highest intellect perhaps on the planet, and women who are determined, knowing their rights, to maintain them and to secure them, unquote. How can such senators explain their attitude, especially those, quote, who desire to keep themselves in the front of the great army of humanity, which is marching forward just as certainly to universal suffrage as to universal manhood suffrage, unquote. This gauntlet thrown down to the Republican leaders brought out a paradoxical debate many supporters of woman suffrage stoutly opposing the amendment, and many opponents defending it. Former suffragists not only acknowledged the justice of the woman's claim to the vote, but admitted as well that it was a proper reconstruction demand. 
They contended, however, that while woman and Negro suffrage were both just and logical, the nation would not accept two reforms at one time. Therefore, the question of suffrage must be divided and the first chance be given to the Negro. This is the Negro's hour became the universal response to the woman's appeal. Opponents of both woman and Negro suffrage, chiefly Democrats, played at friendliness and contended that white women were far better qualified to vote than Negro men. They held that if the suffrage must be extended at this time, the ballot given to educated white women would offset the illiteracy of the black man, and therefore women should be given the first chance. Republicans charged Democrats with insincerity and a desire to embarrass the party in power. Democrats, in turn, charged the Republican leaders with insincerity since they seemed determined to put aside the woman suffrage cause which they had long advocated and to substitute this newer proposition of Negro suffrage. Time proved that the diagnoses of motives made by the rival parties against each other were both correct. Both parties had carried the Civil War into politics, and each was sparring for immediate party advantage. At the end of three lively days of discussion, the vote revealed nine senators for the amendment and 37 against, the vote in opposition including many convinced advocates of woman suffrage. It was the first vote taken in the United States Congress on the subject of woman suffrage. The historic date was December 13, 1866. On December 14, 1866, the Congress conferred the suffrage upon the Negroes of the District of Columbia. President Johnson vetoed the bill January 5, 1867, upon the ground that the voters of the district had rejected Negro suffrage at the polls by an almost unanimous vote. Footnote. A referendum on Negro suffrage in 1865 had resulted in 6,521 votes in Washington and 812 in Georgetown against, and 35 votes in Washington and one in Georgetown in favor. End of footnote. On January 7th, the Senate, and on January 8th, the House passed the bill over the veto. The Congress followed this act by another equally revelatory of Republican intentions toward Negro suffrage. On January 25, 1867, it passed a bill providing that, quote, in the territories thereafter organized, the right to vote should not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, unquote. Thus, the Congress had extended Negro suffrage wherever it had jurisdiction so to do. This bill became law without the president's signature. Under its provisions, Nebraska was admitted to statehood after agreeing that the franchise should be allowed to Negroes. It promptly ratified the 14th Amendment and thereby became an historic bone of contention, the Republicans being immediately charged by the Democrats and by members of their own party with gross irregularity in their haste to secure another legislature to ratify the 14th Amendment, then pending. Whether the charge was true or false, the amendment was ratified by Nebraska June 15, 1867. Meanwhile, the irritable political situation in Washington was growing still more acute. While the Republican Party included a controlling majority of the people outside the South, there were ominous signs of a split, or at least damaging defections. Leaders began to sense the possibility that all that had been gained by the conflicts of war might be lost by the conflicts of peace, and the instinct of self-preservation pushed all other motives into the background. The lofty expositions of the principles of human justice, which, as pronounced by great leaders, had uplifted the nation a few months before, were heard no more. The Congress ceased to talk of the rights of man and occupied itself with plans for saving the party. Under the threat of disruption from within, the party deserted logic and consistency and drove forward with the power of political might. Senators Sumner, Stevens, Wade, Wilson, and Pomeroy, women suffrage advocates in the Congress, made peace with their own consciences by the agreement that the Negro's chance must come before all else. Outside Congress, Wendell Phillips, Garrett Smith, and Horace Greeley adopted and disseminated that view. Thinking is always a laborious and painful process for the average human being, and the great leaders had simplified it for him by giving him an answer for every query, the Negro's hour. From statesman to editor, from editor to people, the maxim passed, easy to remember, soothing to troubled consciences, and comfortably postponing any necessity for further mental exertion. A successful maxim has ever been the most effective oil for troubled political waters. Political leaders stopped discussing woman suffrage, abolitionists declined further aid, 
political papers stopped publishing suffrage letters, editorials ceased, and in Congress, former friends either withheld petitions for woman suffrage or dishonestly introduced them as petitions for universal suffrage, which in the parlance of Congress at the time meant Negro suffrage. Abolitionists like Garrett Smith, who had always decried mistaking policy for principle, now refused to sign a petition to the Constitutional Convention of New York urging that in extension of suffrage no distinction between men and women be made. Horace Greeley pointed out to the women, quote, This is a critical period for the Republican Party and the nation. It would be wise and magnanimous in you to hold your claims, though just and imperative, I grant, in abeyance until the Negro is safe beyond peradventure, and your own turn will come next, unquote. The women replied, quote, No, no, this is the time to press the woman's claim. We have stood with the black man in the Constitution for half a century, and it is fitting that we should pass through the same door now opened to his political freedom, unquote. Well, said Mr. Greeley, if you persevere in your present plan, you need depend on no further help from me or the Tribune. At that moment, the national political leaders had definitely turned their backs upon woman suffrage and were devoting all their energies to the first division of the suffrage question, the enfranchisement of the Negro. The women, surprised and grieved as they certainly were, did not yet comprehend what had happened. Miss Anthony said at this time, quote, Some think this is a harvest time for the black man and seed sowing time for women. Others, with whom I agree, think we have been sowing the seed of individual rights, the foundation idea of a republic for the last century, and that this is the harvest time for all citizens who pay taxes obey the laws, and are loyal to the government, unquote. The great party leaders had given the women staunch promises that their turn would come next, and although the latter keenly felt the humiliation of this discrimination, they still believed in the promises and trusted the leaders who made them. So, when the doors of Congress closed, suffrage leaders, discomfited but still undaunted, turned with brave hopes to New York and Kansas, which offered fields for immediate work. In New York, Negroes owning $250 worth of property had long been permitted to vote, and as Negro suffrage was no novelty in the state, New York was expected to lead in the movement for their full enfranchisement. Although all the referenda on Negro suffrage had failed, party leaders believed that the great state of New York would give a fresh impulse to the proposed change, and therefore the Constitutional Convention of the state was watched by anxious men in all parts of the country. The New York legislature had promptly ratified the 14th Amendment upon the convening of the legislature in January 1867, which added strength to their expectations. The woman suffragists were filled with as urgent a hope. On January 23rd, Mrs. Stanton, by arrangement, appeared before the crowded assembly chamber in Albany where she made a masterly plea on behalf of allowing women to vote for delegates to the Constitutional Convention, basing her argument upon the precedents already established by the state. The legislatures of 1801 and 1821 had each extended the right to vote for delegates to the Constitutional Convention of those years to all disenfranchised classes of men. They had swept away property qualifications and color barriers upon the principle that constitutions must emanate from and be representative of all the people. Mrs. Stanton begged the legislature to continue that precedent in the provision about to be enacted for the election of delegates. Quote, your laws degrade rather than exalt women. Your customs cripple rather than free. Your system of taxation is alike ungenerous and unjust. Just imagine the motley crew from the 10,000 dens of poverty and vice in our large cities, limping, raving, cringing, staggering up to the poles, while the loyal mothers of a million soldiers, whose bones lie bleaching on every southern plain, stand outside, sad and silent witnesses of this wholesale desecration of Republican institutions. Unquote. Logical, eloquent, soul stirring was that marvelous address. The legislatures afterwards declared that no such complete and unanswerable argument had been heard in the Capitol for many a year, but their answer was quote, The time is not ripe for woman suffrage. This is the Negro's hour. Unquote. A resolution to give women the vote for delegates to the Constitutional Convention was promptly introduced, but only nine members voted in its favor. Meanwhile, an active woman suffrage campaign had been in progress for some months in all parts of the state. Committees had been formed, meetings had been held, and petitions had been circulating. 
From the first, the woman workers met the maxim, this is the Negro's hour, at every turn. Clergymen, newspapers, abolitionists, Republicans, who once favored woman suffrage and still professed to do so, refused to help and repeated the well-nigh universal aphorism. Not a letter came to the suffrage headquarters that did not recount experience with advocates of the Negro's hour and the refusal of many suffragists to cooperate with any campaign for woman suffrage until the Negroes were enfranchised. The Constitutional Convention met on June 1, 1867. The first petition presented was for woman suffrage and introduced by George William Curtis. Every day, the petitions for woman suffrage poured in until the total of signatures was 28,000, a remarkable demand for those days. Horace Greeley was chairman of the Elections Committee. Seven days before the convention opened, he had written editorially in the Tribune another endorsement of the principle of woman suffrage and predicted victory in Kansas. But he, it will be recalled, was among those who were willing to sacrifice the principle of woman suffrage to the expediency of the Negro's hour. On June 28, Mr. Greeley, as chairman, rendered the report for the Elections Committee. Just before he arose, suffrage petitions were presented, a few for Negro suffrage, but many for woman suffrage. By request of the women, the last to be handed in was presented by George William Curtis. It was a petition from Mrs. Horace Greeley and 300 other women of Westchester County. Mr. Greeley was visibly embarrassed and irritated. His report recommended universal manhood suffrage for blacks and whites. It included the following, quote, Your committee does not recommend an extension of the elective franchise to women. However defensible in theory, we are satisfied that public sentiment does not demand and would not sustain an innovation so revolutionary and sweeping, so openly at war with a distribution of duties and functions between the sexes as venerable and pervading as government itself. Nor have we seen fit to propose the enfranchisement of boys above the age of 18 years. As no one had made a suggestion that boys be enfranchised, while thousands of the best-known men and women of the state had petitioned for woman suffrage, the allusion to boys was received as an additional and unnecessary offense. Although the subject of woman suffrage was debated several times, the convention refused to submit an amendment to give the voters of the state an opportunity to express their opinions upon it. But, acting under party instructions, it submitted a Negro suffrage amendment. The Friends of Woman Suffrage in the New York Convention admitted that a majority of women might not want the vote, but declared that proportionately many more women than Negroes were asking for the suffrage. The opponents as frankly acknowledged the truth of this assertion, but with shrugs of the shoulder closed the debate with the finality, this is the Negro's hour. The Negro suffrage amendment, though clear of any entanglements with woman suffrage and though supported by the urgent influence of the party in power, was lost at the election. Negro suffrage had been twice submitted before, once in 1846 when it was rejected by a vote of 223,834 to 85,306, again in 1860 and rejected by a vote of 337,984 to 197,150, again in 1868 and rejected by 282,403 to 249,802 from Thorpe's Constitutional History of the United States. With the door closed to further action in New York, Mrs. Stanton and Miss Anthony hastened to Kansas, where the Republican legislature of 1867, by a large majority, had submitted two state constitutional amendments, one for woman suffrage and one for Negro suffrage. This was the first referendum for woman suffrage in the world, and the hearts of the women leaders were again light with hope and anticipation. Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry B. Blackwell, had already been at work in the state for some months. They had sent optimistic telegrams to the annual National Suffrage Convention in May predicting victory, and the convention raised a special fund to aid the campaign. Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, writing about the campaign afterwards, said, quote, With no greater faith did crusaders of old seize their shields and start on their perilous journey to wrest from the infidel the Holy Sepulchre then did these defenders of a sacred principle enter Kansas and with hope sublime consecrate themselves to labor for woman's freedom, to roll off her soul the mountains of sorrow and superstition that had held her in bondage, 
to false creeds and codes and customs for centuries. There was a solemn earnestness in the speeches of all who labored in that campaign. Each heart was thrilled with the thought that the youngest civilization in the world was about to establish a government based on the divine idea, the equality of mankind, unquote. They journeyed westward, confident of victory, for the amendment was a Republican measure sponsored by a Republican governor and advocated by the leaders of the party in Kansas and, as they believed, in the nation. The New York Tribune, with Horace Greeley at its head, the Independent edited by Theodore Tilton, and the Anti-Slavery Standard edited by Wendell Phillips, all circulated widely in the state, and their support was confidently expected. Fourteen of the twenty papers in the state were already supporting the amendment. Why should they not have been lighthearted? Alas, they were to see the Sumner episode in Congress paralleled again and again. Men who had stood shoulder to shoulder with the women leaders in their convention before the war, when the women were serving men's causes, men who had earnestly and eloquently espoused in return the woman's cause when it was in a purely academic stage, now at the first opportunity to put theory into practice, boldly chided the women for their selfish intrusion upon this, the Negro's hour. The Eastern papers upon which they had depended were stolidly silent. When all was over, Mrs. Stanton said, quote, The editors of the New York Tribune, Greeley, and the Independent, Tilton, can never know how wistfully from day to day their papers were searched for some inspiring editorial on the woman's amendment. But naught was there. There were no words of hope and encouragement, no eloquent letters from an Eastern man that could be read to the people. All were silent. Yet these two papers, extensively taken all over Kansas, had they been as true to woman as to the Negro, could have revolutionized the state. But with arms folded, Horace Greeley, George William Curtis, Theodore Tilton, Henry Ward Beecher, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, all calmly watched the struggle from afar. And when defeat came to both propositions, no consoling words were offered for the woman's loss but the women who spoke in the campaign were reproached for having killed Negro suffrage, unquote. Mrs. Stanton testified further that the loss of friends and sympathy, just when they were most needed, was the hardest experience the suffragists had yet been called upon to bear. Again and again, to the very end of the suffrage campaign, half a century later, this same history repeated itself. For human nature is timid and looks out upon the world through small windows. The women had expected stalwart help from Republicans and abolitionists in Kansas. They found that Eastern Republicans had urged the Central Committee to do its utmost for Negro suffrage, which was a party measure, although it had not been endorsed in a national platform, and not to entangle itself in the woman question. The State Central Committee had been called by its chairman, T.H. Drenning. It had issued an address to voters on behalf of Negro suffrage, but had said nothing about woman suffrage. It had summoned ten Republicans who were known opponents of woman suffrage and engaged them to canvass the state for Negro suffrage, permitting them, quote, to express their own sentiments on other questions, unquote. The committee had taken pains to summon no Republicans who advocated woman suffrage, although such Republicans were numerous and the list included as gifted speakers as those who were called. The Republican Campaign Committee therefore officially sponsored and campaigned for the Negro Suffrage Amendment and as officially repudiated the Woman Suffrage Amendment, which their own party legislature had submitted. Negroes were encouraged to speak on their own behalf and were aroused against the Woman's Amendment as an impediment to the success of Negro suffrage. They commonly said that, quote, the black man has the woman question hitched on him, unquote. Before Election Day, the report had traveled eastward that the Republican managers had so incensed the early settlers that they were likely to lose the Negro Amendment, whereupon a list of prominent Eastern Republicans issued an appeal to voters of the United States, urging them to apply the principles of the Declaration of Independence to women, but the appeal came too late. The news had reached Kansas that the commission appointed by the Michigan legislature to consider Negro and woman suffrage had submitted Negro suffrage only, and that Horace Greeley, well known as an advocate of women's rights before the war, had reported the recommendation from the Elections Committee of the New York Constitutional Convention that Negro suffrage should be submitted to the voters, but not woman suffrage. 
that the national party stood for Negro suffrage and not for woman suffrage was therefore accepted in Kansas. The suffrage workers in the Kansas campaign were unanimous in their conviction that had the old-time friends stood steadfast, the woman suffrage amendment could have been won. As it was, it fell behind the Negro Amendment by 1,000 votes, though the latter had been supported by the full party influence of the state and nation. Both were lost. The Republicans were dismayed and irritated that Negro suffrage had failed in the two states upon which they had most depended. The Democrats were rasped by the entire Reconstruction program, and white women were hurt by the apostasy of former friends and the failure of the party of which most, if not all of them, were supporters to uphold the principle of equality and justice. The nation had receded from the exalted unity of sympathy which marks any war period, and public thought had reached that chaotically distrustful, suspicious, and divided state which accompanies any Reconstruction period. In the matter of Negro suffrage, the Congress was not, however, to be deflected from its purpose of completing the ratification of the 14th Amendment, although completing it meant the coercion of at least four of the seceding southern states, all of whom, save Tennessee, had rejected ratification. It is written in imperishable history that they were coerced just the same, and that the Negro was temporarily enfranchised in the ten rebellious states by statutory act of Congress the measure carrying the penalty that until this act was respected by the states and acknowledged in their constitutions, military supervision would be in force. The Fourteenth Amendment was adopted by no less than seven states under military compulsion and the threat that military supervision would continue until they did. Thus it came about that under the threat of the bayonet resolved upon by the majority party in Congress, the black man was enfranchised in the southern states. Under the instructions of the same party, the Congress declined to consider woman suffrage, and the New York Constitutional Convention refused to the voters of the state their constitutional right to decide the question, while in Kansas, that same party used its enormous influence to secure the adoption of Negro suffrage and the defeat of woman suffrage at the polls. End of chapter 4「Chapter five of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics: The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Negro Suffrage as a Political Necessity it was with troubled minds that republican leaders faced the presidential election of eighteen sixty eight negro suffrage had already been temporarily imposed upon the south by the military reconstruction act which also stipulated that the seceding states must include negro male suffrage in their new constitutions these acts were in operation and must be defended of all the referenda on negro suffrage in the north none had been won footnote negro suffrage was carried twice only on referendum it was submitted in eighteen sixty five eighteen sixty seven and eighteen sixty eight in minnesota and at the last date was carried there were only two hundred and forty six negroes in minnesota as late as eighteen seventy iowa submitted negro suffrage in eighteen sixty eight there being less than one thousand negroes of voting age in the state and it was carried a caperton braxton fifteenth amendment End of footnote. senator henry wilson of massachusetts had warned his party in january that the insistence upon negro suffrage had cost a quarter of a million votes similar expressions of doubt were common the fourteenth amendment was still pending waiting for five more ratifications these were certain to be supplied and were in fact supplied by the states reconstructed under military supervision on july twenty eighth the legislatures of florida north carolina louisiana south carolina alabama and georgia having ratified the fourteenth amendment it was proclaimed mississippi and texas 
ratified later while the military reconstruction act had declared that military government should continue in control of the south until those states had adopted a constitution with negro suffrage in them the fourteenth amendment seemed to speak in a softer tone and to say to the south take your choice grant suffrage to your male negroes or lose a portion of your representation in congress the harmonizing of these two acts required explanation not easy to make speaking of the general sentiment concerning negro suffrage at this period james g blaine commented as follows political leaders with few exceptions shunned the issue suffrage preferring to wait until public sentiment should become more pronounced in favor of so radical a movement but a large number of thinking people who gave more heed to the absolute right of the question than to its political expediency could not see how with consistency or even with good conscience and common sense the republican party could refrain from calling to its aid the only large mass of persons in the south whose loyalty could be implicitly trusted to their apprehension it seemed little less than an absurdity to proceed with a plan of reconstruction which would practically leave the state governments of the south under the control of the same men that brought on the civil war the republican convention meeting in chicago in may eighteen sixty eight had unanimously nominated general ulysses s grant the platform included a plank dealing with the question of suffrage the guarantee of congress of equal suffrage to all loyal men of the south meaning negroes was demanded by every consideration of public safety of gratitude and of justice and must be maintained while the question of suffrage in all the loyal states properly belongs to the people of those states the democratic convention meeting in new york in july eighteen sixty eight had declared that the privilege and trust of suffrage belonged to the several states the real difference in these platforms hinged on the fact that republicans were regarding the seceding states as conquered provinces and as such subject to a federal control of suffrage not imposed on loyal states in an old diary kept by miss anthony one finds this entry under date of january one eighteen sixty eight all the old friends with scarce an exception are sure we are wrong only time can tell but i believe we are right there were two reasons for this expression of doubt and anxiety first many of the friends with whom the suffragists had worked side by side before and during the war with no differences of opinion as to policy had now not only deserted the ranks of woman suffrage workers but were also engaged in bitterly denouncing the women for not repudiating their own cause second the suffragists now had a paper of their own the revolution and it was causing a new outbreak of hostility from old friends george francis train a wealthy and eccentric democrat had volunteered as a helper in the kansas campaign and had stirred up much irritation among republicans by his witty and pungent comparisons of the relative qualifications for the vote of white women and black men one day he had asked miss anthony what would give the woman's cause most aid and she had answered a paper that night he announced upon the platform without further consultation with her that when the kansas campaign was over there would be a woman suffrage paper with miss anthony as manager mrs elizabeth katie stanton and parker pillsbury as editors its name would be the revolution its motto men their rights nothing more women their rights nothing less with mr train and david m mellis financial editor of the new york world as financial backers the paper appeared on january eighth eighteen sixty eight it was the first paper of national scope the movement had had challenging the sincerity of both political parties in their attitude on suffrage and advocating negro suffrage when and if included with woman suffrage 
in the extension of universal suffrage in many a brilliant editorial it became at once a power in the political field in the words of mrs stanton some denounced it some ridiculed it but all read it since the two men who had become its financial sponsors were democrats mrs stanton and miss anthony were charged with deserting the slave and enlisting with copperheads and traitors the revolution took the position held by the great leaders of the republican party in eighteen sixty five but from which they had later receded its editorials were based upon the impregnable principles of human rights and its pleas were set forth in terms no logician could challenge it proved terribly embarrassing to the peace of mind of those who admitted the justice and logic of woman's suffrage and who being unable to deny the accusations of inconsistency retreated behind the defence universal under similar circumstances of attacking the accusers in the tone of derision with which naughty boys had once screamed geography girl former comrades in reform now inconsistently hurled at these two consistent leaders the word democrat a term of opprobrium to all loyal citizens at that time the revolution held fast to the position it had assumed upon one occasion it said charles sumner horace greeley garrett smith and wendell phillips with one consent bid the women of the nation stand aside and behold the salvation of the negro wendell phillips says one idea for a generation to come up in the order of their importance first negro suffrage then temperance then the eight-hour movement then woman suffrage three generations hence woman suffrage will be in order what an insult to the women who have labored thirty years for the emancipation of the slave now when he is their political equal to propose to lift him over their heads upon another date it said because we make a higher demand than either republicans or abolitionists they in self-defense revenge themselves by calling us democrats just as the church at the time of its apathy on the slavery question revenged the goadings of abolitionists by calling them infidels if claiming the right of suffrage for every citizen male and female black and white a platform far above that occupied by republicans or abolitionists to-day is to be a democrat then we glory in the name but we have not so understood the policy of modern democracy the american equal rights association held its annual meeting in new york in may eighteen sixty eight lucretia mott its president was detained at home by illness and her family elizabeth cady stanton was vice-president so vindictive had the feeling of abolitionists become toward mrs stanton and miss anthony that thomas wentworth higginson attempted to persuade them that mrs stanton whose official duty it was to call the meeting to order should give way to another miss anthony would not yield this point and mrs stanton presided over the convention the public meetings of the convention were as crowded as ever their speeches as eloquent but a spirit of dissension never before present prevailed owing to the determination of the men advocates of woman suffrage to compel the women to admit the wisdom of all working for negro suffrage at that time let woman suffrage come when and if it would the slightest hint that the fourteenth amendment was not a perfect solution of reconstruction problems brought forth hisses the convention however did not surrender to these attacks but made plans to bombard congress with more petitions this time for a woman suffrage constitutional amendment and for the inclusion of woman suffrage in the proposed revision of government in the district of columbia a group of the more radical members organized a special committee which sent a memorial to the national republican convention urging it to include a woman suffrage plank in its platform apparently it found its way into the mysterious oblivion which received so many similar pleas in after years during the convention theodore tilton presented a resolution half jocularly requesting miss anthony to attend the democratic convention as a delegate appointed by the american equal rights association and to secure in the democratic platform a recognition of woman's rights to the elective franchise the resolution was intended as a gentle jibe at the alleged democratic leanings 
of women who would not postpone work for woman suffrage miss anthony accepted the instruction as sincere and with mrs stanton prepared a memorial to the democratic convention the effect of this news upon the country was to harass the republicans and disturb the democrats the republicans were in absolute control of the political situation in the nation yet many leaders feared for the permanency of this control since the republican attitude toward negro and woman suffrage could not stand the test of reason for the first time since eighteen sixty southern democrats would sit with northern democrats in the coming convention many northern democrats had taken the attitude that if suffrage was to be given to illiterate negro men it should not be denied to educated white women would southern democrats support this position would the voters insist upon logic instead of expediency alarm that abolition women should associate with copperhead enemies of the nation to the extent of presenting them with a memorial was common the democrats unwilling to extend suffrage to any class asked themselves equally disturbing questions and the press found the incident a call for a surprising amount of editorial comment the new york herald said july eighteen sixty eight the democrats have a splendid opportunity to take the wind out of the republican sails on womanhood suffrage against manhood suffrage and for white women especially as better qualified for an intelligent exercise of the suffrage than the thousands of black men just rescued from the ignorance of negro slavery the democratic convention can turn the radical party out of doors upon this issue alone if only bold enough to take strong ground upon it the republicans were greatly relieved when the democratic delegates after hearing the memorial read by the secretary with miss anthony seated upon the platform far from showing any sign of comprehending the opportunity pointed out by the herald received the petition with yells shrieks and demoniacal deafening howls whether silent contempt as shown by the republicans or audible contempt as shown by the democrats is more damaging to a cause was a question women discussed through the next generation they had numerous after experiences with both varieties of treatment meanwhile the presidential campaign moved forward francis newton thorpe emphasizes the extension of the suffrage to the negro as the great political issue of the campaign braxton says that negro suffrage for the south was a paramount issue while john mabry matthews in his history of the fifteenth amendment takes the position that negro suffrage as a subject of a possible fifteenth amendment was not recognized as a campaign issue at all footnote a search through the editorials and news columns of the leading newspapers of the country issued during the presidential campaign of eighteen sixty eight fails to reveal a single direct reference to any proposed fifteenth amendment four days after the election however a senator and also wendell phillips on the same day announced the forthcoming amendment forbidding disfranchisement on account of race or color matthews page twenty end of footnote james g blaine throws a strong light upon these three contradictory statements the evasive and discreditable position in regard to suffrage taken by the national republican convention was keenly felt and appreciated by the members of the party when subjected to popular discussion there was something so obviously unfair and unmanly in the proposition to impose negro suffrage on the southern states by national power and at the same time to leave the northern states free to decide the question for themselves that the republicans became heartily ashamed of it long before the political canvas had closed even when there is no deliberate intent to deceive it is inevitable owing to the enormous size of the united states and its division into states each of which has its own political point of view that party policy interpreted by a great number of campaign speeches be expounded with with varying meaning the campaign of eighteen sixty eight was no exception to this rule speakers pressed the view in the east that the negro needed and must have the vote for his own protection in the middle west that those states having very small colored populations should enfranchise the negro by referenda in order to support the policy of insistence upon negro suffrage in the south and assured the far west where fear of chinese domination was professed that negro suffrage was intended only for the south 
in all parts of the country campaigners took the ground phrased by senator carl schurz of missouri for negroes suffrages of right for rebels of grace throughout the campaign the term impartial suffrage was employed to denote negro suffrage universal suffrage could not be used as that would include women and the frank words negro suffrage were offensive to many impartial suffrage had come into use to express the delicate discriminations intended the inclusion in the electorate of negroes and the exclusion of northern white women and southern white traders the word impartial could scarcely be construed by any known definition as explanatory of this unique political policy and it therefore served to confuse rather than clarify the general understanding the fact that the southern states had accepted the fourteenth amendment was announced however with a heartening assurance that political turmoil would now end and this had more effect than any other point in the discussion the stoical submission of the south to the provisions of the fourteenth amendment was seized upon by its northern advocates as confirmation of the justice and wisdom of the measure and the election closed in victory for the republicans with the national tension much relieved the republican congress triumphantly re-elected returned to washington determined to forget all inconsistencies and to make negro suffrage secure in the south by further action many proposals were made and debated and the entire subject of suffrage became again a consideration to congress the first move toward ensuring suffrage to the negro by means of another federal amendment was made by senator pomeroy of kansas in december eighteen sixty eight his proposal based the suffrage on citizenship thus including women george w julian of indiana introduced a similar amendment in the house also three other bills one to give the vote to women in the district of columbia another to grant it to women in the territories and later one to give it to the women of utah the first two of these bills followed the precise lines taken by the congress relative to the negro while congress was making ready to submit a fifteenth amendment the first suffrage convention held in washington took place in january eighteen sixty nine a new feature at women's rights conventions was the attendance of several colored men who were given the opportunity of free speech all denounced the women for jeopardizing the black man's chances for the vote and one standing by the side of that saintly superwoman lucretia mott presiding officer declared that god intended the male should dominate the female everywhere abolitionists too were there to defend the black man's prior claim and the spirited debate ran on for many hours the women contending that it was never expedient to deny justice and white and black men uniting in the declaration that justice in this particular case must yield to expediency elizabeth cady stanton made another masterly speech which incidentally expressed the sentiments of suffragists in regard to the proposed fifteenth amendment said she while poets and philosophers statesmen and men of science are all alike pointing to women as the new hope for the redemption of the race shall the freest government on the earth be the first to establish an aristocracy based on sex alone to exalt ignorance above education vice above virtue brutality and barbarism above refinement and religion not since god first called light out of darkness and order out of chaos was there ever made so base a proposition as manhood suffrage in this american republic after all the discussions on human rights in the last century in our southern states women were not humiliated in seeing their coachmen gardeners and waiters go to the polls to legislate for them but here in this boasted northern civilization women of wealth and education who pay taxes and obey the laws who in morals and intelligence are the peers of their proudest rulers are thrust outside the pale of political consideration with miners paupers lunatics traitors and idiots with those guilty of bribery larceny and infamous crimes the first congressional hearing ever secured for suffrage followed this convention mrs stanton addressed the district committee of the senate with women representatives of nineteen states at her back in a powerful plea to save the women of the district from being debarred from the exercise of the right of suffrage 
in and out of the congress the debate concerning the further extension of suffrage continued at white heat president grant recommended the ratification of the negro suffrage amendment in his inaugural address in march eighteen sixty nine saying the question of suffrage is one which is likely to agitate the public so long as a portion of the citizens of the nation are excluded from its privileges in any state it seems to me very desirable that this question should be settled now commenting privately upon the political situation he said however i could never have believed that i should favor giving negroes the right to vote but that seems to be the only solution of our difficulties petitions poured in from many states to refer the question to referendum or to submit it to conventions called for the purpose throughout the angry contentions over negro suffrage the women quoted often the well-known suffrage letter of the martyred lincoln his influence lay over the country like the spirit of a benediction but although the letter helped the women's cause it rasped the republicans lincoln's letter read as follows new salem june thirteenth eighteen thirty six to the editor of the journal in your paper of last saturday i see a communication over the signature of many voters in which the candidates who are announced in the journal are called upon to show their hands agreed here's mine i go for all sharing the privileges of the government who assist in bearing its burdens consequently i go for admitting all whites to the right of suffrage who pay taxes or bear arms by no means excluding females a lincoln the fifteenth amendment was submitted on february twenty seventh eighteen sixty nine footnote fifteenth amendment section one the right of citizens of the united states to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the united states or by any state on account of race color or previous condition of servitude section two the congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation in the footnote whereupon the phrase the negro's hour on all tongues from eighteen sixty five to eighteen sixty eight was cast aside and immediately forgotten in his place there came a new slogan a political necessity which served as effectively to explain the inexplicable as its predecessor under its suggestion loyal voters were cautiously led to overlook the fact that the amendment was not only in direct contradiction to the suffrage plank in the platform by which the republicans had been charged with national power but also to the solemn pledges made by campaigners in the west as has been shown above the republican platform had firmly relegated all authority for negro suffrage to the states with the exception of those recently in rebellion and had not mentioned women at all yet out of the maze of politics with no emphatic change of public opinion the proposed fifteenth amendment had emerged as a political necessity with a united party behind it and so carefully had the preparations been made that eleven states ratified the amendment within the first month on march fifteenth eighteen sixty nine mr julian of indiana introduced a sixteenth amendment which copied the phraseology of the fifteenth amendment and substituted sex for race color or previous condition of servitude the women of course were back of this amendment which was a federal woman suffrage amendment but though supported by a ceaseless succession of petitions and unanswerable plea it was utterly ignored the congressional friends who had introduced the suffrage bills senators pomeroy of kansas and wilson of iowa and mr julian of the house were all regarded as irregular by the party majority which had decided that negro suffrage superseding all other considerations had become an imperative political necessity the fifteenth amendment made the rounds of the legislatures in a year and a month and was proclaimed as ratified by the necessary three-fourths of the states on march thirty eighteen seventy the states of california delaware kentucky maryland oregon and tennessee having gone democratic rejected the amendment the state of new jersey ratified subsequent to the proclamation by the secretary of state the ten reconstructed states of virginia north carolina south carolina florida georgia alabama mississippi texas arkansas louisiana where negroes carpetbaggers and a minority of loyal southern men directed the government are counted in the list of ratifying states new york ratified in a republican legislature april fourteenth eighteen sixty nine and a democratic legislature the following year withdrew her consent january five eighteen seventy the democratic legislature of ohio rejected the amendment may four eighteen sixty nine and a republican legislature ratified it january twenty seventh 
eighteen seventy the federal secretary of state ruled that a state once ratifying an amendment could not reverse its action and reject it but that a state rejecting an amendment could reverse its decision and ratify it the ratifications of both states were therefore counted in the total these points were never reviewed by the supreme court the fourteenth and fifteenth amendments had been submitted by congress and ratified by a strictly party vote the republicans voting solidly for them and the democrats against them with the ratification of the fifteenth amendment the united states became the first country in the world to elevate all men to the sovereignty of voting citizenship in all other countries there were certain classes of men excluded with the women the discrimination had been advertised and emphasized by the fourteenth amendment and its triply reiterated adjective male this political degradation put upon women would have been less humiliating had there been promise of relief but the prediction of mr beecher was completely realized the public mind had indeed shut up altogether appeals to party leaders who had faithfully pledged their help to women when the negro's hour should have passed fell upon deaf ears and resisting minds many republicans were disturbed by the realization that the reconstruction measures had violated logic justice consistency and common sense they were irritated by the fact that these measures had not brought peace and stability but it was too late to reconsider too late to be logical and obeying a psychological rule they began to hate woman suffrage and woman suffragists incidentally the occasion of the self-accusation of their own consciences in the south an antipathy toward the negro race as the cause of the southern humiliation which was very different from the pre-war variety was manifesting itself in a new and portentous form the north had enfranchised the negro the south had capitulated in form but the sheeted ku klux klan riding by night had established a reign of terror over the ignorant and superstitious freedmen compared to which their former slavery was comparative freedom the political future looked dark and troubled the moral courage of statesmen but recently contending in exalted phrase for human liberty and equal rights for all had utterly surrendered to the politicians eternal plea of expediency once mrs stanton lecturing in california met senator bingham of ohio stumping the state on behalf of the fourteenth and fifteenth amendments which that state had declined to ratify mrs stanton gently charged him with insincerity since every argument he was presenting applied equally to woman suffrage with a cynical smile he replied that he was not the puppet of logic but the slave of practical politics victimized by practical politics and its slaves the politicians suffragists pushed for just the same with their national and state programs End of chapter five chapter six of woman suffrage and politics this is a library vox recording all library vox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librarybox.org this recording is by josie cho woman suffrage and politics the inner story of the suffrage movement by carrie chapman cat and nettie rogers schuler the first victory in the midst of the baffling discouragement politics had wrought a tiny flickering star of victory arose out in the great mysterious west so unimportant did it seem at the time that the revolution gave but three lines to the announcement and that in an inconspicuous corner the map of the united states of america as represented in the geographies used in the public schools of the day denoted most of the territory lying between nebraska and the rockies as the great american desert out of this vastness the federal government had carved a section large enough to accommodate an empire and called it wyoming a sparse and shifting population of adventurous men sometimes with families was scattered along the trails which led from the council bluffs to oregon or california the union railroad was completed halfway across wyoming in eighteen sixty seven and a city of tents sprang up as if by magic at the last stop called cheyenne thousands of men poured in where dozens had been before trappers hunters miners prospectors 
but all seekers of adventure. Saloons, dance halls, houses of prostitution, always numerous in frontier settlements, increased to such an extent that crime became rampant. Neither life nor property was respected, and robberies, holdups, and murders were everyday occurrences. The better element petitioned the Congress for the protection of an organized government. The Congress immediately granted the request by a bill providing for a territorial government, and President Johnson signed the bill. The conflict between the President and Congress was then at the climax of its bitterness, and Congress refused to confirm the President's appointees for the new territorial administration. The Wyoming government, therefore, was not organized until May 1869 when appointees of President Grant took charge. During the two intervening years, lawlessness had grown even more audacious, and the town of Laramie, established as another outpost on the Union Pacific, was duplicating the experiences of Cheyenne. The first election took place in September 1869, its purpose being the choice of delegates in the first legislature. At South Pass City, the largest town in the state, a settlement consisting of rows and shacks stretching along a ledge of the Wind River Mountains, the call for an election found 3,000 persons washing gold and dreaming of fortune. The blue and the gray, the loyalist and the copperhead, with the bygones laid aside, were amicably following the common lure of gold hunting. Politics offered an acceptable diversion and they promptly fell in line as Republicans and Democrats. Each group prepared to nominate candidates and defend them to the death. At this point, 20 of the most influential men in the community, including all the candidates of both parties, were invited to dinner at the shack of Mrs. Esther Morris, who had followed her husband and three sons into the trackless west. She was a newcomer with a complete understanding of the Eastern political treatment of Negro and woman suffrage, and her ears were still rigging the words of Susan B. Anthony, one of whose public lectures she had heard just before setting out upon her western journey. To her guests, she now presented the woman's case with such clarity and persuasion that each candidate gave her his solemn pledge that if elected, he would introduce and support a woman's suffrage bill. The election resulted in the choice of W.M.H. Bright, Democrat, who was elected president of the council when this legislature met October 1st, 1869. Many years after, in order that justice should be done the memory of Mrs. Morris, Captain Nickerson, the Republican candidate defeated in 1869 but elected in 1871, wrote the story, giving entire credit to Mrs. Morris in the act of the territory, and filled his documentary evidence at the county seat of Sweetbriar County. The Wyoming September election reflected the hostility to Negro suffrage common in the country and was conducted in a manner to be expected of a turbulent population but are recently brought under the discipline of law. In the words of Hon. H. J. W. Kingman, Associate Justice in the Territory, there was a good deal of party feeling developed and Election Day witnessed a sharp and vigorous struggle. The candidates and their friends spent money freely and every liquor shop was thrown open to all who would drink. Peaceful people did not dare to walk the streets in the towns during the latter part of the day and evening. At South Pass City, some drunken fellows with large knives and loaded revolvers swaggered around the polls and swore that no negro should vote. When one man remarked quietly that he thought the negroes had a good right to vote just as any of them had, he was immediately knocked down, jumped on, kicked and pounded without mercy, and would have been killed had not his friends rushed into the brutal crowd and dragged him out, bloody and insensible. There were quite a number of colored men who wanted to vote, but did not dare approach the polls that until the United States Marshal himself at their head and with revolver in hand, escorted them through the crowd, saying he would shoot the first man that interfered with them. There was as much quallering and tumult, but the Negroes voted. This was only a sample of all the day's doing, and it was characteristics of the election all over the territory. The result was that every Republican was defeated and every Democrat candidate elected. Mr. Bright, the newly elected president of the council, was described by those who knew him as a man of much energy and good natural endowments, but without much school education. His wife was reported to be a woman of unusual attainments, and Mrs. Morris completely converted them both to woman suffrage. Mr. Bright is quoted by ex-governor Hoyne as saying to his wife, Betty, it's a shame that I would be a member of the legislature and make laws for such a woman as you. You are a great deal better than I am. You know a great deal more, and you would have make a better member of the assembly than I. I have made up my mind that I will do everything in my power to give you the ballot. Arrived at Cheyenne, Mr. Bright set himself to the task of converting woman suffrage, the 22 men who composed the two houses of the legislature. 
He reminded his fellow members that the legislature was unanimously democratic and that should it vote suffrage to women, it would show the world that Democrats were more liberal than the Republicans who confined their extensions of the vote to Negroes, and that should be the Republican governor veto the bill, it would give the Democrats a decided advantage. With all he argued the justice of the cause and pointed out such an act would advertise the territory as nothing else could. Meanwhile, men and women in different parts of the territory wrote their delegates, urging support of the bill on the 27th of November. Mr. Bright, having secured the necessary number of pledges, introduced the suffrage bill. The Council Territorial Senate, without discussion, passed by the measure by a vote of A6, nice 2, absent 1. In the House, the bill found an opponent as determined as was Mr. Bright, Mr. Ben Sheeks. A lively and acrimonious debate followed, and many amendments designed to kill the bill were introduced and voted down, one being that the word woman be stricken out and the words all colored woman and squaws be substituted. The original bill named 18 years as the qualified age of the woman voter. A proposal to substitute 21 for 18 was the only change made, and thus amended the bill passed. I, 6, nays, 4, absent 1, the council concurring. Several of those who had voted for the bill smarting under the gibes of outsiders who looked upon suffrage for a woman as wildly ridiculous soon regretted having done so. Friends and foes alike turned to John W. Campbell, the unmarried Republican governor, and pleaded with him, some to sign, some to veto the bill. Woman also called upon him, pleading for his signature to the bill. His interviewers found him vacillating, doubtful as to his duty. The determining factor proved to be a memory rising in the background of his mind and growing each hour more vivid and persistent. In that memory, he saw himself and other young boys, 19 years before, acting under the impulse of curiosity tempered with mischief, stealing into the back seats of the Second Baptist Church in Salem, Ohio, his birthplace. The attraction was a woman's right convention, which the entire village agreed was an unheard of innovation, a few of the other elders defending it, but more condemning it. The convention was the first in the state and different in one respect from others at that period. It was entirely officered by a woman and not a man was allowed to sit on the platform, speak, or vote. The woman issued an address to Ohio Women, a memorial to the state con- constitutional convention, about to sit and pass 22 resolutions covering the whole range of women's political, religious, civil, and social rights. Although greetings of encouragement were received from many of their chief leaders of the movement, the convention speakers were all Ohio women. When it was over, the men who had been in attendance met together and endorsed all the ladies had said and done. An episode so remarkable had not failed to make its impression upon the boy, although in the intervening years no occasion had arisen to transform that the impression into conviction. Now the boy, grown to man, heard the voices once more, listened again to the arguments, and knew no answer to their appeal. With his mind made up in the words of ex-governor Hoyt, he saw that it was a long-deferred justice and so signed the bill as gladly as Abraham Lincoln wrote his name to the proclamation of all emancipation of the slaves. Of course, continues Mr. Hoyt, the women were astounded. If a whole troop of angels had come down with flaming swords for their vindication, they would have not have been much more astonished than they were when that bill became a law and the women of Wyoming were thus clothed with the habiliments of citizenship. The two years which intervened before the next legislative election were eventful ones to the woman's cause in the territory. Soon after the passage of the bill, Mrs. Esther Morris was surprised by an appointment as Justice of the Peace at South Pass City. Owing to the fact that the population was sparse and regular courts were not yet numerous, a Justice of the Peace was an important officer and frequently heard cases, which in after years would have gone to the other courts. The rowdies of the place undertook to intimidate Mrs. Morris and thus force her resignation, and incidentally proved that women were unequal to the performance of political duties, but they retired humiliated and discomfited from the contest. Nearly 40 cases were brought before her, and so justly did she administer them that not one was appealed to a higher court. Justice Morris and her court at the South Pass City aroused widespread comment throughout the nation, the reports being both true and false, favorable and unfavorable. At the first term of the district court held after the first legislature, women as well as men were drawn for grand and petite jurors. 
The enemies of woman suffrage had caused this action, intending thereby to make the whole cause of woman in politics so obnoxious to the public that it would prepare the way for a repeal of the woman suffrage measures at the next legislature. On the contrary, the woman jurors were continuously complimented and praised by the judges and press. The first mixed grand jury was in session for three weeks during which time bills were brought for consideration of several murder cases, cattle and horse stealing and illegal branding. All of the bills strangely commencing, we good and lawful male and female jurors on oath do say. When Justice Howe addressed this jury in incidentally a packed courtroom, he assured the woman that there was not only no impropriety in their serving as jurors, but that their service was needed in the effort to secure a law bidding community. Said he, you shall not be driven by the sneers, jeers, and insults of a laughing crowd from the temple of justice as your sisters have been from some of the medical colleges on the land. When the grand jury was discharged, Judge Howe complimented the woman upon the service rendered during this first term of the territorial court, saying that women would make just as good jurors as men, if not a great deal better. A petite jury soon thereafter tried a murder case, the indictment having been brought in by the grand jury. Six women and six men composed the jury. When the case was referred to the jury, it was unable to come to a decision, and the jury, as is customary, was locked up. This was the possibility that had done duty in all lands as a decisive reason why women should never serve as jurors. The sheriff of Albany County, Wyoming, solved the problems easily enough upon this first occasion. The jury was retired in two rooms at the chief hotel. A man bailiff was placed on guard at the door of the men's room and a woman bailiff the door of the woman's room there was still another incident new in the history of juries while the men in the effort to while away a few gray hours were engaged in playing cards smoking and drinking beer their attention was arrested by the notes of a hymn coming from the woman juror's room easily heard through the thin walls Presently, they heard the minister's wife ask the jurors to kneel with her in prayer while she asked the highest court to give them guidance in arriving at a just verdict. For two and a half days and nights, the jury labored to reach a decision. Fifty years after, when the secrets of that jury's action could be told, it was learned that the six women voted from the first for conviction and that the delay was occasioned by three men who voted for acquittal. The verdict was manslaughter and was signed with a pen fashioned from an eagle's quill. The news of these women jurors spread far and wide. King William of Prussia sent a congratulatory cable to President Grant upon this evidence of progress, enlightenment, and civil liberty in America. While arousing much discussion and winning approval among the law-abiding women, jurors were less popular among other classes, as was evidenced in the second legislature. The legislature of 1871 contained a minority of Republicans. Nine days after the legislature convened, a bill to repeal woman suffrage was introduced. The leader of the suffrage opposition in 1869, Ben Sheeks, was the only man in either house who had returned, and he was elected as Speaker of that house. He devoted his entire attention to the repeal bill, which was passed the following day, eyes nine, nays three, absent one, every vote for, for repeal being Democratic, and every vote against being Republican. On November 28th, the bill passed the council by a vote of ayes 5, all Democrat, and nays 4, all Republican. Governor Campbell, Republican, promptly vetoed the bill, saying in his message that to repeal it at the time would advertise to the world that women in their use of enfranchisement had not justified the acts of the members of the previous session and that such an imputation would be false and untenable. The House passed the repeal over the governor's veto by the required two-thirds vote, ayes nine Democrats and nays two Republican, with two absentees who had paired their votes. In the Council of the Repeal, who did not secure a two-thirds vote, ayes five Democratic, nays four Republican, thus woman suffrage was preserved by a single vote, for had one Republican deserted and voted with the Democrats, the two-thirds vote for repeal would have been secured. No effort was ever made again to repeal woman suffrage in Wyoming. Twenty years after 1889, a constitutional convention met in September to frame a constitution preparatory to statehood. In the preceding June, a women's convention had been called, and a hundred of the most prominent women of the territory had attended it. The purpose of the convention had been carried out in the adoption of the following resolution. Resolved that we demand of the constitutional convention that women's suffrage be affirmed in the state constitution. 
not a single delegate in the constitutional convention opposed women's suffrage but one delegate proposed that the question be submitted to the people separately from the constitution as it was likely to prove difficult for the state to get into the union with women's suffrage in the constitution the proposal brought out such a staunch and unyielding protest and the women's suffrage clause was included in the constitution the committee on territories in the house of representatives recommended the admission of wyoming but william m springer democrat of illinois brought in a minority report consisting of 23 pages, 21 devoted to objections because of the women's suffrage article. The territory was Republican and would send two Republicans to the Senate. The battle fiercely waged against its admission as a state was therefore led and chiefly supported by Democrats, women's suffrage furnishing a convenient excuse for opposition. The ghosts of Reconstruction came forth from their hiding places and stalked the aisles of the United States Senate and House once more off and on making their presence known whenever the bill came up during a period of six months. Lengthy speeches by representatives from Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Georgia, Tennessee, Missouri, and Texas, bitter, punitive, and ignorantly hostile, marked the opposition. Woman's suffrage will result in unsexing womanhood. It is a reform against nature. Let her stay in the sphere to which God and the Bible have assigned her. They are going to make men of woman, and the correlative must take place that men become women. During the debate, when it seemed impossible that Congress would consent to the admission of Wyoming with the women's suffrage in its constitution, Delegate James Carey telegraphed the Wyoming legislature, then in session asked for advice. The answer came back, We will remain out of the Union a hundred years rather than come in without women's suffrage. This staunch response stiffened the faith of the Friends and won votes of Republicans who were not yet ready to approve of women's suffrage. The Bill of Admission passed the House March 28, 1890, by a vote of 139 ayes to 127 nays. The procedure was repeated in the Senate, action being postponed several times. The effort to amend by striking out women's suffrage having failed there also, the Bill of Admission was passed June 27, 1890, by 29 ayes, 18 nays, 37 absent. In the Congress, Republicans opposed to women's suffrage had held quite unitedly that the state should have the right to decide who should vote within it, the Democrats, always contending that suffrage was a matter for the consideration of states, now refused to accept the principle and demanded a federal veto on state action. The bill passed by a party vote, Republicans voting for admission and Democrats against. From the year 1869, every governor, chief justice, and many prominent citizens of Wyoming have given endorsements of the beneficence of women's suffrage. Not one reputable person in the state said over his or her own signature that women's suffrage is other than an unimpeachable success in Wyoming. At one time, suffragists in the East were dismayed because Boston papers carried an interview with a prominent gentleman from Wyoming, who declared that all the beliefs of the opponents of women's suffrage had proved true in the state. A telegram to the mayor of Cheyenne, asking for particulars concerning this prominent gentleman, brought back the quick response. A horse thief convicted by a jury, half of whom were women. For 50 years, Wyoming served as the leaven which lightened the prejudices of the entire world. She pronounced false every prediction of anti-suffragists and gave so much evidence of positive good to the community arising from the votes of women that she became the direct cause of the establishment of women's suffrage in all the surrounding states. Amid the gibes and the jests, the ridicule and the ribaldry, Wyoming stood fast through the generations until the nation acknowledged that she was right and stood with her. End of chapter 6 Recording by Josie Cho January 31st, 2021. Chapter 7 of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicalia. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Politics After the War. The enfranchisement of the Negro did not have the effect upon the politics of the nation that was expected. General Grant had been elected in 1868 with a handsome majority, but, said Mr. Blaine, an analysis of the vote gave food for serious reflection. Six of the reconstructed states gave Grant their electoral vote. Georgia and Louisiana gave theirs to Seymour, the Democratic candidate, 
and it was believed that this had happened through fraud and intimidation of the Negro. If these conditions had obtained in all the states, and Mr. Seymour had received the electoral vote of the solid South, he would, in connection with the vote he received in the North, have had a majority over General Grant in the Electoral College. Many Southern men had fought in the Northern Army, risking their lives for the cause of the Union, and had proved effective leaders of the Negroes in the first days of Reconstruction. But by degrees, when Negro suffrage became the test of loyalty, the strongest of them deserted the Republican Party and joined the secessionists' standard. The remnants of the various political parties which had existed in the South before the war drew together under the banner of the Democratic Party, whose watchword in that section was white supremacy. The so-called carpetbaggers from the North were driven out, intimidated, or their views modified. Few white men remained as leaders, and the black man was far too inexperienced to command his own forces. The Fifteenth Amendment was proclaimed on March 30, 1870, and on May 31, 1870, the Congress passed what was familiarly known as the Force Bill. In the effort to quiet Southern disturbances, overthrow the Ku Klux Klan, and ensure Republican control over the South. The bill was based upon the idea that until the colored man should have reached the point at which he could compete on even terms with the white man, his undeveloped powers must be reinforced. These southern state governments proved a source of angry contention inside the Republican Party in the North, and the military supervision of southern elections, with its need of continual defense, was waxing more and more unpopular. The strong characters who had unceasingly striven for Negro rights were passing out, and new men, whose convictions had not been formed in the long and hard-fought abolition struggle, were less ardent. As once the political necessity of enfranchising the Negro to save the party had been urged, the advancing years brought forth talk of unloading the Negro in the interest of the salvation of the same party. The Pacific Coast continued to be alarmed by the possibility of Chinese political domination. The Chinese were later denied citizenship by Act of Congress at the instance of the Irish of California. And this state of the public mind, in that section, was aggravated by the presence of large numbers of Southern men who, lured by the greater promise of the undeveloped resources of the West, had migrated there after the war. The Negro vote proved annoying to Republicans in other ways. The gentleman's game of battling on the floor of presidential conventions for the nomination of favorite candidates lost much of its interest and thrill in the presence of full delegations from all the southern states, mostly colored, few of whose members were competent to play their part on the plane of mental and ethical equality with other delegations. Their expenses were usually paid, and they demanded favors not easy to confer. Candidates earliest in the field, or with most money at their command, had an unfair advantage which further increased the irritation. All in all, the Northern conscience became easier, and less determined to protect the Negro in his right to vote. Negro suffrage had proved a load to carry instead of an added strength. It became odious to Northern Republicans to give military protection at elections to men the majority of whom could neither read nor understand. As odious to them as the intimidating Ku Klux methods had become to the better classes of the South. Any mention of further extensions of suffrage affected the average Republican politician with mental nausea. Meanwhile, the hands of Northern suffragists were stretched across Mason and Dixon's line and accepted by Southern women, timidly at first, but after the lapse of 25 years, with friendly loyalty to the common cause. How I hate Susan B. Anthony! exclaimed one Southern woman in 1895 to an astonished visiting suffragist from the North. Why, do you know her? 
No, the lady had never seen her, but Susan B. Anthony was an abolitionist. The abolitionists had won the war and had sent Sherman marching across southern plantations, one of which had belonged to her father. The same abolitionists had devised Negro suffrage and the force bill. Therefore, all of them and all of their ideas were gall and wormwood to the South. Fearless Southern women, in time, within the locality whose peculiar prejudices they knew and understood, waged unremitting warfare against these prejudices, and no stronger characters did the long struggle produce than those great-souled Southern suffragists. They had need to be great of soul. As late as 1920, the average Southern Democrat was filled with explosive rage at any mention of woman suffrage. He would not and could not argue the question. His response to all appeals was a scornful, sputtering ejaculation, Negro women. For years, Southern white women demonstrated by census reports that, when enfranchised, white women would outnumber black men and women in all save two southern states. Yet the invariable answer was that of the Mississippi senator, though less rudely given. We are not afraid to maul a black man over the head if he dares to vote, but we can't treat women, even black women, that way. No, we'll allow no woman's suffrage. It may be right, but we won't have it. A southern woman pleading with a congressional committee for the submission of the federal suffrage amendment in 1918, was publicly chided by a congressman for having deserted the traditions and the political creed of her section. As no action had ever been taken by the Republicans to enforce the penalty of loss of representation on account of the flagrant violation of the 14th Amendment, the state of Mississippi in 1890 called a constitutional convention for the, frankly, avowed purpose of restoring white supremacy. It accomplished the purpose by establishing an educational and poll tax qualification. No federal penalty being enforced, Louisiana called a convention in 1898 with the determination to go further. She adopted all the Mississippi handicaps and added the Grandfather Clause, which limited the vote to those who had it before the Civil War and their legitimate descendants. As the Republicans still took no action, other Southern states followed, with constitutional conventions in quick succession, until in the Black District, the Negro was almost completely disfranchised. In after years, the Supreme Court, upon an Oklahoma case, declared the Grandfather Clause wholly unconstitutional. But to this day, no political action has ever been taken to reduce Southern representation as provided by the 14th Amendment. Southern Democratic states disfranchised the Negro by as unconstitutional processes as the Republican Northern states had employed in enfranchising him. Whether the Negro enfranchised a generation before his time or the woman, enfranchised two generations after her time, suffered the greater injustice, it may take another century to demonstrate. Certainly both paid heavy penalties for the political blunders of the white male. The real reason behind the attitudes of both Congress and the courts, concerning the enforcement of the amendments, is the apathetic tone of public opinion which is the final arbiter of the question. In the technical sense, the amendment is still a part of the supreme law of the land, but as a phenomenon of the social consciousness, a rule of conduct, no matter how authoritatively promulgated by the nation, if not supported by the force of public opinion, is already in process of repeal. In the year 1872, the Republican Party suffered a split over financial problems. A convention of delegates, calling themselves liberals, met in Cincinnati and nominated Horace Greeley for president. The women, led by Miss Anthony, were there to ask endorsement of woman suffrage. But although many of the old and true suffrage friends were delegates, they would not heed the appeal, 
to load the new party with issues other than those which called it into being. The Republicans met in Philadelphia in June, anxious and distressed by the defection of the so-called liberals. They needed all the help possible and for the first time put a woman's plank in the platform. A plank that deserves to go down in song and story as the ablest effort to say something and give nothing that was ever indulged in. The Republican Party is mindful of its obligations to the loyal women of America for their noble devotion to the cause of freedom. Their admission to wider fields of usefulness is received with satisfaction, and the honest demands of any class of citizens for equal rights should be treated with respectful consideration. Suffragists spoke of it not as a plank, but as a splinter. The Democrats, meeting in July, made no mention of women. A strong pressure was now put upon suffragists to throw all their forces into the Republican side of the balance, and many did, believing with Henry Blackwell that the recognition of 1872 would be endorsement in 1876. The chairman of the National Republican Committee wired Miss Anthony to come to Washington, but as there was serious illness in her home, she was unable to reach Washington until five days later, and then in response to a second telegram. Said the chairman, At the time we sent our first telegram, we were panic-stricken, and had you come then, you might have had what you pleased to carry out your plan of work among the women. But now the crisis has passed, and we feel confident of success. The same change of front was soon noticeable in the press. When it looked as if Greeley might be elected, the Republican newspapers were filled with appeals to the women, and the plank was magnified. But as the campaign progressed and the danger passed, it was almost wholly ignored by press and platform. Horace Greeley was defeated, and for 48 years the Republicans, with restored confidence, not needing women's help, made no further pronouncement concerning woman suffrage in a national platform. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Woman Suffrage and Politics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Two Amendments and Many Women. At the annual Woman Suffrage Convention of 1872, Miss Anthony led a lively discussion as to whether the 14th and 15th Amendments could be interpreted as extending the vote to women as well as to Negroes. Strong resolutions were adopted in favor of a declaratory act of Congress to affirm this interpretation. A hearing was granted before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Mrs. Stanton, Miss Anthony, and Isabel Beecher Hooker, on behalf of these resolutions, made arguments which could not have failed to leave conscientious senators with disturbed peace of mind. Many senators, representatives of Congress, and eminent lawyers in all parts of the country interpreted the 14th Amendment as securing the vote to Negroes and to women. The Attorney General of Nebraska ruled that women were voters under that amendment. In order to test this possibility and acting under legal advice, women in several states, inspired by the action of their national leaders, attempted to register and vote in 1871 and 1872. Usually their right either to register or to vote after having registered was denied by election inspectors, and the method pursued was to bring action against the inspectors for that refusal. Learned and able counsel volunteered in most instances to conduct the defense of the inspectors. Four cases surpassed all others in importance, three drawing an opinion from the Federal Supreme Court. In chronological order, these were... 1. The case of 70 women in the District of Columbia appealing from the decision of the District Supreme Court 
decided december eighteen seventy one chief counsel senator matthew carpenter of wisconsin two the case of myra bradwell only indirectly bearing upon the subject but testing the meaning of the fourteenth amendment appealing from the supreme court of illinois which had denied her admission to the bar decision given december eighteen seventy two three the case of virginia l minor appealing from the supreme court of missouri chief counsel francis minor an eminently able lawyer of that state decided october eighteen seventy four and four the case of susan b anthony and thirteen other women who november eighteen seventy two registered and voted in one ward in rochester new york this case did not reach the federal supreme court but attracted the widest comment of all the cases the tendency of judges and counsel to turn aside from the consideration of the legal points involved in these cases in order to deliver lectures upon the proper sphere of women was a noticeable feature common to all of them and that prejudice seriously affected the judicial decision will be manifest to readers of the literature of the cases manifest too will be the muddle in which court opinions left the fourteenth amendment even to this day it is doubtful if any exposition explanation or interpretation of that amendment has been given which is capable of being clearly understood by an average american mind said albert g riddle counsel for the women voters of the district of columbia colored male citizens now vote constitutionally and rightfully although the word white stands as before in most of the state constitutions and yet they vote in spite of it some potent alembic has destroyed the force of that word we are at once referred to the fifteenth amendment for a solution the fifteenth amendment does not confer anything it is a solemn mandate to all concerned not to deny this right which is clearly recognized as having existed before you see in a moment this does not confer anything it uses no words of grant it expressly recognized as an already existing fact that the citizens of the united states have the right to vote it is absolutely certain that colored male citizens do not claim their admitted right to vote from the fifteenth amendment whence did they derive it from the fourteenth amendment if so then did women acquire it by the same amendment francis minor also counsel in the same case picked up the argument at that point and carried it forward clearly the fifteenth amendment does not confer any right of suffrage clearly prior to the fourteenth amendment colored men had no right to vote the thirteenth amendment gave them no such right but between the thirteenth and fifteenth amendments in some way or other the colored man came into possession of this right of suffrage and the question is where did he get it if he did not get it under the fourteenth amendment by what possible authority are they voting by hundreds of thousands the legislative and constitutional provisions that prohibit their voting still remain unrepealed upon the statute books of many states but yet they do vote there is no way by which they legally can vote except by the operation of the fourteenth amendment chief justice carter delivered the opinion of the court the main point being this clause the first of the fourteenth amendment does advance them women to full citizenship and close them with the capacity to become voters the constitutional capability of becoming a voter created by this amendment lies dormant as in the case of an infant until made effective by legislative action judge carter turned aside from his opinion on the legal points under consideration to discourse upon the failure of universal suffrage for men and by implication betrayed his own doubt of the wisdom of universal suffrage the decision was quoted with ridicule in the press as meaning that women were voters but had no right to vote the most important phase of the myra bradwell case is the explicit evidence that popular opinion at the time so governed the views of the supreme court of illinois and of the federal supreme court as completely to control their verdict the illinois court discoursed at great length upon the sphere of women and whether it would 
promote justice to permit women to engage in trials at the bar. Mrs. Bradwell's qualification was admitted, but her petition was denied because she was not only a woman, but a married woman. Illinois denied to women the right to hold office and to a married woman the right to make contracts. Mrs. Bradwell had pointed out that a woman, a married woman, under precisely the same conditions, had been admitted to the bar in Iowa. But this precedent, fixed by a neighboring state, made no impression upon the mental operations of either the Illinois or the federal Supreme Courts, which were molded by older custom. Justice Miller rendered the judgment of the federal Supreme Court, denying that privileges and immunities protected by the United States include the practice of law, and Justice Bradley, concurring, gave a further opinion in which he delivered a long address on the historic sphere of woman, in which man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The Minor case traveled somewhat farther. Frances Minor, Mrs. Virginia Minor's husband, joined with her in the appeal as required by the Missouri law and served as chief counsel, said he. While the Negro votes today in Missouri, there is not a syllable of affirmative legislation by the state conferring the right upon him. Whence then does he derive it? There is but one reply. The 14th Amendment conferred upon the Negro race in this country citizenship of the United States, and the ballot followed as an incident to that condition, or to use the more forcible language of this court in the slaughterhouse cases, 16 Wall 71, the Negro, having by the 14th Amendment been declared a citizen of the United States, is thus made a voter in every state of the Union. If the 14th Amendment does not secure the ballot to women, neither does it to the Negro, for it does not in terms confer the ballot upon anyone. In summing up, Mr. Minor claimed that the plaintiff was entitled to any and all the privileges and immunities guaranteed to all citizens by the first section of the 14th Amendment, and that the elective franchise is a privilege of citizenship in the highest sense of the word. The decision delivered by Chief Justice Waite was long and indefinite. The chief points were, the Constitution does not define privileges and immunities of citizens. The amendment did not add to the privileges and immunities of a citizen. No new voters were necessarily made by it. The Constitution has not added the right of suffrage to the privileges and immunities of citizens. Since the Constitution of the United States does not confer the right of suffrage upon anyone, the Constitution and laws of the several states, which commit that trust to men alone, are not necessarily void. If suffrage was one of these privileges and immunities, why amend the Constitution to prevent its being denied on account of race? Neither judge nor court has yet been able to point out, in terms comprehensible to the average man on the street, wherein lay the potent alembic cited by Mr. Riddle in the District of Columbia case, which had granted the vote to Negro men. The laws of no state had conferred the vote upon them. The Federal Supreme Court, before 1884, in all cases seeking interpretation of the two amendments, held that the Constitution of the United States, including the new amendments, conferred the vote upon no one. If neither state nor federal constitutions, nor laws, had conferred the vote upon colored men, where did they get it? The Military Reconstruction Act had given the Negro the vote in disloyal states, but that act did not apply to the loyal states and presumably was intended as a temporary measure. No other act of any kind had been passed. Justice Miller, in the case of Ex parte Yarborough in 1884, delivering the opinion of the federal Supreme Court, declared, While it is true, as said in the Reese case, that the 15th Amendment gave no affirmative right to the colored man to vote, yet it does substantially confer on the Negro the right to vote, and Congress has the power to protect and enforce that right. In bewilderment, the public ask, How may an amendment substantially confer a right when it does not confer it? Just why the Congress, 
in which sat many of the ablest men of the nation, was unable or unwilling to write amendments which could be understood by those who read them is difficult of comprehension. But the explanation is undoubtedly to be found in the fact that the 14th Amendment was a compromise of many conflicting views. A participant in the controversy in writing its inner history throws light upon the puzzling situation. He quotes Alexander Stevens, the father of the Reconstruction measures and leader of the majority in the House of Representatives, as saying, Don't imagine that I sanction this shilly-shally, bungling thing that I shall have to report to the House tomorrow. Replying to a protest following the public announcement of the provisions of the amendment, Mr. Stevens wrote, In the course of last week, the members from New York, from Illinois, and from Indiana held, each separately, a caucus to consider whether equality of suffrage, present or prospective, ought to form a part of the Republican program for the coming canvass. They were afraid, so some of them told me, that if there was a nigger in the woodpile at all, that was the phrase, it would be used against them as an electioneering handle, and some of them, hang their cowardice, might lose their elections. By inconsiderable majorities, each of these caucuses decided that Negro suffrage, in any shape, ought to be excluded from the platform, and they communicated these decisions to us. Our committee hadn't backbone enough to maintain its ground. Yesterday the vote on your plan was reconsidered, your amendment was laid on the table, and in the course of the next three hours we contrived to patch together, well, what you've read this morning. The Fourteenth Amendment extends certain rights to the Negro, but not the suffrage. It merely threatens to cut down the representation of states which deny the vote to any male inhabitants. The Fifteenth Amendment declares in stern tones that the right to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of certitude, and gives the Congress power to enforce the provision. It takes a careful reading of the long congressional debates on the subject to reveal the potent alembic that was challenged by Mr. Riddle as destroying the force of the word white as one of a voter's qualifications. It was politics. The National Republican Party passed on to the state Republican parties an interpretation that was not written in the law. The Negro must have the vote in the South to protect himself from the domination of white men. The Republican Party must have the support of loyal men in the secession states if there is to be peace, and the loyal men are the Negroes. The right of the state to make its own suffrage laws shall be respected, and therefore no conferring of the vote upon the Negro shall be done by federal act. These amendments mean, however, that the Negro shall have the right to vote in your state. They do not confer the vote, they merely threaten you with penalties if you deny the vote. Politics, therefore, put into the amendments the meaning not clear to the reader of the text, and over whose obscurity courts and lawyers tripped. The Negro voted by the authority of the federal law forbidding the states to deny him the right to do so, but not conferring the right upon him. The states accepted this political order and allowed him to vote, although no state law conferred the vote upon him. This strained attempt not to offend states' rights sensibilities when considered in connection with the methods of ratification, including the crack of the party whip at the north and the threat of the bayonet at the south, offers a curious example of states' rights in theory and centralized autocracy in practice. It was in connection with the controversy and confusion over the 14th and 15th Amendments that one of the most spirited chapters of all suffrage history was enacted. It was the last and most noteworthy of the four cases enumerated above, through which the women of that day tried to get into the electorate by way of the door opened by the 14th Amendment. On November 5, 1872, Susan B. Anthony and 13 other women voted in a ward of Rochester, New York, in an effort to test the provisions of the amendments as applying to women. The Supreme Court of the nation had already passed upon the District of Columbia cases, and the decision had not only aroused keen criticism and comment, 
but many lawyers charge the court with prejudice and failure to meet squarely the question involved. Other cases were pending, and Rochester gave a fresh impulse to the popular discussion as to what the 14th and 15th Amendments really meant. At this juncture, politics, directed by Washington, took a hand in the Rochester proceedings. A few days after Miss Anthony's vote, a deputy United States Marshal appeared at the various houses of the Rochester women voters and arrested them in the name of the United States government upon the criminal charge of having voted without having a lawful right to vote. Authority for the United States government to take charge of the alleged violation of state election laws was laboriously drawn from the so-called Ku Klux Klan law, which had been passed by Congress to prevent disfranchised rebels from exercising the suffrage before being pardoned. The women were gathered, fitly enough, in the same office where before the war fugitive black men and women had been examined and returned to slavery. Bail of $500 each was ordered for their appearance at the Albany term of the United States District Court in January 1873. Miss Anthony refused to give bail and petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, her petition being presented by Judge Selden, one of the most eminent attorneys in the state of New York. On January 16th and 17th, 1873, the annual National Woman's Suffrage Convention met in Washington. Miss Anthony named the possible methods of securing the vote for women as, by state constitutional amendments to be adopted by electors at the polls, by a federal constitutional amendment to be adopted by a two-thirds vote of both houses of the Congress and ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures or by taking their right under the 14th Amendment. She pointed out that court decisions permitting women to avail themselves of this right or a declaratory act of Congress were necessary. The vaults in yonder capital, said she, hold the petitions of 100,000 women for a declaratory act, and the calendars of our courts show that many women are already testing their right to vote under the 14th Amendment. I stand here under indictment for having exercised my right as a citizen to vote at the last election, and by a fiction of the law, I am now in custody and not a free person. The convention passed resolutions declaring its confidence that the 14th Amendment enfranchised women as certainly as Negroes, and again called upon Congress for a declaratory act. Miss Anthony hastened from Washington to Albany where her petition was denied by United States District Judge N. K. Hall, and her bail increased to $1,000 with orders for appearance at the May term in Rochester. This was in January. Again, she refused to give bail, but Judge Selden, her counsel, against her wishes and without her knowledge, went on her bond. When she learned that by this fact she had lost her chance of getting her case before the Supreme Court, by writ of habeas corpus, she tried to have the bond cancelled, but to her chagrin, her counsel pronounced this impossible. Immediately after Judge Hall's decision, all the women and the three inspectors were indicted by a grand jury. Between the hearing before Judge Hall and his decision, Miss Anthony had time, accompanied by her counsel, to appear before the Commission on Amendments to the New York State Constitution, then sitting in Albany, and make a powerful plea to include woman suffrage in the proposed changes. Before the May term of court, Miss Anthony held a meeting in every post office district of her county, Monroe, 29 in number, speaking upon the subject, is it a crime for a United States citizen to vote? The United States District Attorney, Richard Crowley, notified her that if she did not desist, he would have the case moved to another county when the court met and made good his threat. Claiming that no jury could be drawn which might not be prejudiced in her favor, he asked and secured a change of venue to the United States District Court at Canandaigua, Ontario County, allowing just 22 days before the trial. The change was first ordered on Friday, and on Monday she held her first meeting in Ontario County, and followed it by 21 other meetings. Matilda Jocelyn Gage came to her aid and held 16 meetings. 
When on June 17, 1873, the trial took place, the courtroom was filled by politicians, lawyers, and prominent citizens, among them ex-President Fillmore and Judge Hall, who had denied the writ of habeas corpus. The jury was sworn in with Judge Ward Hunt presiding, United States District Attorney Crowley appearing for the United States government, and Henry R. Selden and John Van Voorhees for the women voters. Some hours were consumed in the arguments presented. The one point which stands out most conspicuously after the lapse of half a century was this statement of Judge Selden's. Miss Anthony believed and was advised that she had a right to vote under the provisions of the federal constitutional amendments. She was advised as clearly that the question of her right could not be brought before the courts for trial without her voting or offering to vote. Her motives were pure and noble and carried no intent of fraud or crime. If by the laws of her country she shall be condemned a criminal for taking the only step by which it was possible to bring the great constitutional question of her right before the courts for adjudication, it adds another reason to those I have advanced to show that women need the ballot for their protection. When the last word had been spoken, those assembled were shocked to see the presiding judge draw from his pocket a written opinion, clearly prepared before he had heard evidence or argument. He directed the jury to bring in a verdict of guilty, and when Judge Selden protested at this unwarranted act, he refused to have the jury polled, and in the midst of the controversy, discharged it. The character of Judge Hunt's previously prepared opinion was equally astonishing. Said he, Miss Anthony knew that she was a woman and that the Constitution of this state prohibits her from voting. Since Miss Anthony based her claim to a vote upon the fact that she was a citizen of the United States and upon the belief that the vote was included among the privileges and immunities which the 14th Amendment, as a part of the federal Constitution, forbade any state to abridge, this point of view begged the whole question. Quite possibly this curious failure, even to comprehend what the contention was about, would not have been expressed had the judge waited to hear the case before he wrote his opinion. He further held that although she might have believed that she had the right to vote, and voted in good faith, and that she had been advised that such right was hers. Nevertheless, she was guilty of a crime because she had had no legal right to a vote, the motive having no bearing upon the question. There was widespread condemnation of Judge Hunt's conduct of the case, and none were more outspoken than some members of the jury, who boldly declared that if they had had the opportunity, they would not have voted guilty. The Albany Law Journal, though scornfully disapproving woman suffrage, admitted that the judge usurped power in taking the case from the jury. An editorial discussion of the question, can a judge direct a verdict of guilty, was frequent. Those who held sympathy neither with woman suffrage nor the effort to test the 14th Amendment pronounced Judge Hunt's assumption of authority a dangerous and menacing threat to free government. A motion for a new trial was denied. A fine of $100 and the costs of the prosecution were the penalties imposed. Miss Anthony responded with a declaration that she would never pay a penny of the unjust penalty, whereupon Judge Hunt said that the court would not order her committed until the fine was paid, and although this procedure was contrary to the custom and the law, the fine was neither paid nor remitted. Had the judge demanded the penalty or imprisonment, Miss Anthony would have gone to prison and could then have taken her case directly to the Supreme Court of the United States by writ of habeas corpus. Lawyers claimed that the fact that she had been denied a trial by jury would have made her discharge certain. Had this case been permitted to find its way to the Supreme Court, or had the jury at Canandaigua been allowed to perform the ordinary function of jurymen, history might have been decisively changed. The trial of the inspectors which followed attracted little attention by comparison, but it was in reality an even more unwarranted usurpation of authority. The inspectors served under the laws of New York, and any failure to perform their duty in accordance with that law was clearly an offense against state, not national law. Yet they were arrested by officers of the United States 
and tried by a judge of the federal supreme court for the crime of violating a new york law the inspectors were found guilty although it was made quite clear that they believed it to be their duty to accept the women's votes and that they acted in good faith and without criminal intent this time the jury was permitted to act although counsel was denied the privilege of addressing it and the judge virtually directed it to bring in a verdict of guilty which it did in february eighteen seventy four about nine months after their trial the three inspectors were seized by the united states authorities and thrown into jail because they had not paid their fines as was well known they had been advised not to do so senator sargent of california promptly presented a petition to president grant who at once remitted their fines they were however in jail a week during which time the best of meals were furnished them by the fifteen women voters hundreds of citizens called to pay their respects and the entire city regarded the proceedings as a joke the press jibed at united states district attorney crowley unmercifully for prosecuting the young men and being afraid to attack the woman who shrinks not from any of the terrors of the law but she was neither arrested nor approached again in reference to her fine she was importuned to allow an appeal to be made to President Grant, for whom she had voted, to remit her fine, but this she refused to do. Instead, by the advice of Judge Selden, she addressed an appeal from Judge Hunt's decision to Congress in her own name. Her petition was presented in the Senate by Senator Sargent of California, afterward minister to Germany, January 1874, and was referred to the Judiciary Committee, which through its chairman, Senator Edmonds of Vermont, asked to be discharged from consideration as Congress had no authority to act. Senator Matt H. Carpenter of Wisconsin, acknowledging that Congress could not remit the fine imposed nor secure a new trial, yet condemned the injustice of the trial, denouncing it as without precedent and called the attention of Congress to the need of an amended system of jurisprudence, since a citizen may be tried condemned and put to death by the erroneous judgment of a single judge, and no court can grant him relief or a new trial. In the House, the petition was reported adversely by the Judiciary Committee, a letter being incorporated in the report from District Attorney Crowley, urging the committee not to degrade a just judge and applaud a criminal. As Judges Hall and Hunt and District Attorney Crowley were appointees of the administration, Political considerations assisted the committee in arriving at its conclusions. Benjamin F. Butler, however, offered a minority report recommending that the prayer of the petitioner be granted. He, too, declared that she had had a mistrial, and though both Senator Carpenter and Mr. Butler had been careful not to accuse too boldly the motives or the qualifications of Judge Hunt, their subtle comments were recognized as a severe reproof. Although the women failed to secure an opinion from the federal Supreme Court that the 14th Amendment included women under its provision concerning the privileges and immunities of citizens, the conviction remained with suffrage leaders and many able lawyers that the words of the law could be only so interpreted. Again and again in after years, eminently qualified lawyers with briefs in hand begged suffragists to make further appeals to the court for affirmation of their rights as set forth in the amendment but the women knew that the potent alembic of politics would not be made to operate in their case and they steadfastly refused to waste any more time in efforts to get favorable judicial decisions to support their claim to the suffrage under the provisions of that amendment end of chapter eight Chapter 9, Part 1 of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. The Woman's Hour That Never Came. Three years were consumed in the process of writing the word male into the federal constitution, two more in completing the enfranchisement of the Negro. 
both were strictly republican party measures and were achieved by the combined political force of a majority party and the military power of the nation the demand to include women in any further extension of the suffrage although supported at the time by men of great influence in party and nation was effectively evaded all along the way by the proposal to let the women wait this is the negro's hour the woman's hour will come to get the word male in effect out of the constitution cost the women of the country fifty-two years of pauseless campaign thereafter during that time they were forced to conduct fifty-six campaigns of referenda to male voters four hundred and eighty campaigns to get legislatures to submit suffrage amendments to voters forty-seven campaigns to get state constitutional conventions to write woman suffrage into state constitutions two hundred and seventy-seven campaigns to get state party conventions to include woman suffrage planks thirty campaigns to get presidential party conventions to adopt woman suffrage planks in party platforms and nineteen campaigns with nineteen successive congresses millions of dollars were raised mainly in small sums and expended with economic care hundreds of women gave the accumulated possibilities of an entire lifetime thousands gave years of their lives hundreds of thousands gave constant interest and such aid as they could it was a continuous seemingly endless chain of activity young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended during this long stretch of time the dominant political parties pitted against each other since eighteen sixty used their enormous organized power to block every move on behalf of woman suffrage the seeming exceptions were rare and invariably caused by breaks or threatened breaks in party ranks strong men in both parties and in all states championed the woman's cause in legislatures and in political conventions and eventually the number of these became too large to be ignored but it was not until public opinion far in advance of party leaders indicated that a choice between woman suffrage and party disruption must be made that organized party help was given and even then it was neither united nor wholehearted between the adoption of the fifteenth amendment march thirtieth eighteen seventy which completed the enfranchisement of the negro and nineteen ten lie forty years during which women watched prayed and worked without ceasing for the woman's hour that never came the party whips had cracked to drive the nation to enfranchise the negro they cracked and cracked again to prevent the enfranchisement of women whenever there was an exception and the party stood by woman's suffrage in a referendum success came to the woman's cause most victories were won however in spite of party opposition it was with amazing courage that the four hundred and eighty campaigns to secure the submission of state constitutional amendments from legislatures were conducted in these campaigns millions of names were presented to the several legislatures in the form of petitions party endorsement was sought in political conventions candidates were interviewed hundreds of whom gladly gave their pledges of support press aid was solicited and in most states a majority of the newspapers were won over to support the submission and adoption of the question these campaigns were conducted in all the thirty-three states and territories lying outside the original pro-slave district in some continuously through the half-century in some intermittently yet in forty years as a result of the four hundred and eighty campaigns only seventeen referenda were secured as oregon submitted the questions four times in those years and washington south dakota and colorado twice respectively the number of states wherein the voters expressed their opinion upon state amendments was eleven only since no legislature or constitutional convention possesses the authority to extend or withhold suffrage from women and has only the right to pass the question on to the voters or to refuse to do so the autocracy of this record makes impressive legislative history 
the strongest suffrage organizations were in the east where the movements began and where the ablest of the early leaders lived it was these states which had furnished the initiative and the insistence which enfranchised the negro by bayonet yet in massachusetts new york new jersey pennsylvania ohio indiana illinois and iowa where the woman's suffrage appeal was continual during those forty years no suffrage referendum was secured of the seventeen referenda in those years all were in states west of the mississippi except three four referenda michigan eighteen seventy four Colorado, 1877, Nebraska, 1882, and Oregon, 1884, were normal byproducts of the Negro suffrage agitation. Ten were the direct result of the defection within the dominant parties, chiefly Republican, which was produced by the populist uprising which reached its crest between 1890 and 1900, and the three remaining washington eighteen eighty nine rhode island eighteen eighty seven and new hampshire nineteen o two were due to local causes two states only were won in these seventeen referenda colorado and idaho in both cases the party organizations were broken wide asunder and each faction endorsed the amendment in the fifteen other states where amendments were submitted there were disturbed political conditions in nine but in no case did the opposing factions endorse the amendment and the regular party organization used its power to defeat the amendment a cursory review of these referenda campaigns state by state makes clearer and clearer the character of the opposition that piled higher and higher in the path of suffrage workers michigan in eighteen seventy four a special session of the michigan legislature submitted a woman suffrage constitutional amendment the debate indicated that the action was an attempt to do justice to the women who had been made political inferiors of the recent slaves forty thousand men voted in favor but the amendment was lost and little record of the campaign has been preserved nebraska in eighteen sixty nine the legislature failed to submit the question of woman suffrage by a single vote in one house in eighteen seventy one the legislature memorialized the constitutional convention sitting that year urging it to submit woman suffrage and it did so but the entire constitution was defeated it was never charged that the woman suffrage position caused the defeat of the constitution in eighteen eighty two the legislature by the required three-fifths vote submitted a woman suffrage amendment the state constitution stipulates that an amendment shall receive a majority of all the votes cast in the election at which it is voted upon a handicap so serious that most amendments submitted under this condition however popular have gone down to defeat liberal promises of help had been received from many men of prominence for that day the organization was good the campaign carefully planned and more efficient than any yet conducted but as election day approached the women were mystified because so many men failed to fulfill their promises and developed a sudden aloofness the reason for this defection was soon apparent the organ of the brewers association sent out its orders to defeat the amendment to every saloon bills posted in conspicuous places by friends of the amendment mysteriously disappeared or were covered by others of an opposite character and the greatest pains were taken to excite the antagonism of foreigners by representing to them that woman suffrage meant prohibition judge o p mason who had agreed to give ten lectures for the amendment and whose advocacy would have had immense weight was engaged to speak for the republican party and at every place but one the manager stipulated that he should be silent on the amendment there was a large german vote thoroughly aroused over the menace of prohibition and prejudiced against and afraid of the woman vote nebraska was a state where men voted on first papers and with the appearance of evidence of possible organized opposition threatening candidates and parties politicians flew to safety like a frightened covey of ducks the republican party machinery set in action against the amendment defeated it two to one fraudulent ballots with no mention of the amendment on them were found in large numbers 
ballots with wording differing from all that prescribed by the legislature were also numerous all these were counted in the total number of votes at the election of which the amendment must secure a majority and were therefore virtually counted as against the amendment the correct returns were never known and many suffragists had justification for the belief that had the election been an honest one the amendment would have been won the vote for woman suffrage was twenty five thousand seven hundred fifty six against fifty thousand six hundred ninety three the suffragists learned in this campaign that they had an insidious enemy which was not public opinion nebraska announced that this was the germans hour rhode island the legislature of rhode island in eighteen eighty seven submitted an amendment leaving just twenty-nine days for a campaign in that time the women held ninety-two public meetings but the two political parties passed the word along the line that the amendment was to be defeated no secret was made of the bipartisan order which combined with normal conservatism and prejudice brought the heaviest defeat yet recorded or more than three to one six thousand eight hundred and eighty nine against and two thousand one hundred ninety five in favor washington in eighteen eighty three the territorial legislature of washington had followed the example set by the legislatures of wyoming and utah and extended full suffrage to women the women voted in large numbers at every election in eighteen eighty seven a man named harlan young convicted by a jury composed in part of women contested the verdict upon the ground that women were not legal voters grover cleveland had come into the presidency in eighteen eighty four and adhering to the spoil system common to both parties had filled the supreme court of washington with southern democrats whose prejudices against woman suffrage were impregnable the court declared the suffrage law invalid because its object had not been properly described in its title the next legislature eighteen eighty nine promptly reenacted the law free from the defects of the former one and women continued to vote washington territory was agitating for statehood and the enemies of prohibition were determined that women should not vote on the constitution soon to be drafted they arranged that the judges of the spring municipal election in a district of spokane should refuse to accept the vote of mrs nevada bloomer the wife of a saloon keeper she then brought action against them the case was speedily rushed through and on august fourteenth the supreme court decided that the act of january eighteenth was invalid as a territorial legislature had no authority to enfranchise women mrs bloomer refused to appeal and no one else could the women were therefore debarred from participating in the next election the decision of the court was certainly an illegal one for the following reasons one the act of congress authorizing the organization of the territory had stated clearly that all persons should be allowed to vote upon whom the territorial legislature might confer the elective franchise two the women of wyoming had voted under such a law since eighteen sixty nine and in utah since eighteen seventy three when Congress in 1887 disfranchised the women of Utah in order to strike a blow at polygamy, that act admitted the right of the territorial legislature to enfranchise women. Yet Congress, which had enfranchised the Negro by bayonet and defended his vote with military force, admitted Washington to statehood on a constitution framed by a convention whose members had been elected by voters of whom a considerable number had been illegally restrained from voting. Moreover, the constitution had been adopted by the same illegal electorate. The liquor forces, having thus illegally disposed of the woman vote, conducted a successful campaign to elect a convention that would represent their wishes. The convention submitted a separate suffrage amendment to male voters only, and both parties, under the direction of liquor interests, used the power of their organizations to prevent its passage. There was no doubt in any mind that 1889 was the saloon's hour in Washington these four referenda in the twenty years from eighteen sixty nine to eighteen eighty nine represented the sole results of efforts to secure full suffrage for women 
in the year eighteen ninety a farmers party later called the populist party emerged from earlier farmers organizations the farmers alliance the grange and others in western agricultural states and as it held the balance of power it exercised an enormous influence upon american politics for the next decade as all these states were controlled by large republican majorities the new party drew its chief support from that party the minority democratic party fusing with the populists produced a combination which either wrested power from the republicans or shared it with them simultaneously a movement arose in western mining states caused by the low price of silver and aiming to correct it by giving silver a place with gold at the ratio of sixteen to one as the basic standard of money values the silver movement split the republican party in most of the mining states and the populists fusing with democrats and silver republicans became an even more important political factor in those states as the result of these political changes grover cleveland was elected in eighteen ninety two the free silver coinage movement reached its climax in eighteen ninety six and the fifty sixth congress eighteen ninety seven to eighteen ninety nine contained six populist senators and twenty seven members in the house while in all the western states many populist or fusion members were elected to the legislatures and in some instances were in control in washington the fusionists were so successful that the eighteen ninety seven legislature was made up of reform elements that legislature submitted a woman suffrage amendment to the voters of eighteen ninety eight it was defeated but the adverse majority was only half as great as in the election of eighteen eighty nine south dakota the splitting and fusing of political groups had direct bearing upon the suffrage referendum in south dakota in eighteen ninety the territory of dakota created in eighteen sixty one was later divided and north and south dakota were admitted into the union in eighteen eighty nine the dakota territorial legislature of eighteen seventy two came within one vote of extending full suffrage to women and in eighteen eighty five it did so following the example of wyoming utah and washington women at the time voting in all three the republican governor gilbert a pierce vetoed the bill of eighteen eighty five upon the ground that congress might not welcome dakota into statehood with woman suffrage in operation since congress had taken no steps to enfranchise women which it had a right to do the constitution accepted by congress when south dakota was admitted to statehood provided that the first legislature at its first session should submit a constitutional woman suffrage amendment to the voters but the constitutional convention submitted a prohibition amendment which went to the voters in eighteen eighty nine at the same election which adopted the constitution after a bitterly fought battle prohibition was carried and an immediate campaign was undertaken by the liquor forces for its repeal they regarded as the first outpost to be taken the defeat of the suffrage amendment which according to plan was to come to vote the following year eighteen ninety before the campaign began suffragists anticipated victory in south dakota the farmers alliance was a large and powerful body and its officers had not only agreed to exert the full influence of their organization for the amendment but had urged miss anthony to come to south dakota to conduct the campaign in person in order that it might the more certainly be won the knights of labor had agreed by resolution to support the amendment with all our strength these two organizations later decided to form an independent or people's party and at the convention called for the purpose of adopting a platform and nominating a ticket the leaders repudiated their pledges having decided that the new party would be overloaded should it endorse woman suffrage when this group of professed friends refused endorsement nothing could be expected of the regular parties weakened by the defection of those who composed the new party the republican party recognizing that three hundred sioux indians would vote in the state by the act of the federal government invited three blanketed representatives to sit on the floor of the convention with the delegates but refused to allow any women so honored a position the suffrage amendment was ignored in the platform it was the indians hour 
when susan b anthony addressed the democratic convention a delegation of illiterate russians wearing large badges against woman suffrage and susan b anthony were carefully seated where their presence announced the party attitude as the delegates came out of these two conventions men at the door thrust into their hands a paper called the remonstrance published by ladies in boston who were not yet courageous enough to indicate their responsibility by printing their names on the sheet the men who distributed the papers were saloon men and the sight of their dirty hands and degenerate faces would have made the gentle remonstrance squirm the outstanding feature of this campaign was the employment for the first time in a large way of the foreign vote as a block voted under direction and paid for the assistance it rendered south dakota permitted foreigners to vote on their first papers and there were thirty thousand russians germans and scandinavians in the state very many thousands had been there from six months to two years only unable to read or write in any language or to speak english these men were boldly led to the ballot boxes under direction of well-known saloon henchmen and after being voted were marched away in single file and with an unmistakable sight of men and women poll workers were paid for their votes the movement to curb the practice of buying votes which led in after years to laws in all states more or less strict had scarcely begun and in the new state of south dakota there was no redress the amendment was lost twenty two thousand seventy two eyes forty five thousand six hundred eighty two nays majority opposed twenty three thousand seven hundred ninety it was the russians hour the legislature again submitted the question in eighteen ninety eight and again the russians were mobilized like dumb driven cattle and paid to defeat the amendment suffragists drew the following conclusions from this campaign one that non-english speaking illiterate men who were voted by the thousands did not go to the polls voluntarily nor had they offered their own services some power had enlisted them voted them paid them what was it two whatever that power was it had either commanded the political parties to do its bidding or the political parties had called it to their aid colorado in eighteen ninety three colorado had inaugurated a populist governor and the legislature with republicans in control in the house and populists in the senate submitted the question of woman suffrage to the voters most populists voting for the measure and the majority of republicans against this was not the first experience with suffrage referenda in colorado the constitutional convention of eighteen seventy six preparing for statehood had submitted a separate amendment which had come to vote in eighteen seventy seven the debate had indicated that the details of negro enfranchisement were fresh in the minds of the delegates and that some amends were due the women a hurried organization had been effected and a creditable campaign conducted the amendment was lost but the effects of the campaign persisted and the organization had never entirely lapsed old friends and new now united in preparing for the contest of eighteen ninety three there was no state election that year the state political machines were not in operation and the rank and file of the voters received no orders county nominating conventions were held and in most counties one or more party conventions endorsed the amendment all populist conventions and many republican conventions taking this stand very many individual republicans and democrats frankly espoused the amendment and assisted in the campaign a factor everywhere manifest was the influence of wyoming no imaginative prediction of baneful results to arise from woman suffrage was allowed to travel far for a man from wyoming was certain to come forward with a scornful denial although there were many women who labored long hours hard and earnestly and although the consecrated central committee was wise and alert the campaign as compared with those that came after was neither elaborate nor thorough no organized opposition appeared until the eve of election day the denver brewers association then gave hurried orders to the saloons assessing them for funds 
dodgers were issued bearing the imprint of the brewers association on the first few issued which found their way into circulation the imprint was soon removed however and the thousands later distributed from door to door carried no evidence of their origin fortunately a newspaper came into possession of some of the first dodgers issued and revealed the character of this eleventh hour attempt to defeat the amendment tricks with which suffragists afterwards became sickeningly familiar were also used a lawyer was employed to discover ways of throwing ballots out of the count on technicalities influence with election officials wielded by some of the opponents secured ballots bearing the words for the amendment against the amendment the question to be voted upon was not an amendment by the provision of the constitution of eighteen seventy six woman suffrage could be granted by the legislature if confirmed by referendum the women of the state had been enfranchised by the legislature and the voters were now being asked to confirm or deny the attorney general gave a prompt opinion which was published by the state authorities to set the voters right at the polls the measure was carried by a majority of six thousand three hundred forty seven the counties that had gone republican and democratic in the previous election gave a majority of four seventy one against the measure the counties that had gone populist gave the favorable majority end of chapter nine section one chapter nine part two of woman suffrage and politics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org woman suffrage and politics the inner story of the suffrage movement by carrie chapman catt and nettie rogers schuler the woman's hour that never came part two startled by their own victory the women wanted to do something in celebration which would remain forever after in their memories a crowd gathered in the suffrage headquarters and they talked it over but being unable to devise any unique plan some one started praise god from whom all blessings flow and people passing by outside heard a great chorus of song after which the tired workers went home quietly with praise god singing in their hearts informed suffragists derived two convictions from the colorado campaign which stayed with them to the end one that which was achieved in the state would not have been possible had there been no break in party control two that which had been done in colorado could be done in any western state were voters free to vote their own convictions kansas the populist contest in kansas was particularly aggressive and bitter in eighteen ninety two the populist swept the state and the following election was regarded as the test of strength as both populists and republicans carried planks favoring the submission of a woman's suffrage amendment in their platforms the legislature of eighteen seventy three submitted the question the kansas equal suffrage association was one of the most alert in the united states its president mrs laura m johns one of the ablest of presidents a series of county conventions by way of preparation had been held in all the more thickly populated sections kansas was a state where women were trained in politics in eighteen sixty one school suffrage had been extended to women there had been a woman suffrage referendum in eighteen sixty seven that had aroused public opinion and its effects were still manifest in eighteen eighty seven the legislature granted municipal suffrage to women kansas was a prohibition state and municipal politics had centered largely upon the enforcement of this law the women because they were voters had been drawn into the party campaigns and yet by the exercise of rare good sense had kept their organization non-partisan mrs johns was a republican but mrs annie e diggs a populist was made vice chairman of the kansas auxiliary to the national american woman suffrage association work without ceasing was now the order of every day more able well-trained women were engaged in the campaign than in all the preceding ones put together all agreed that should the republican and populist parties endorse the amendment as they had the question of submission there was no possibility of defeat 
the republican convention met on june sixth the leaders had already decided to throw woman suffrage overboard to save the party there were no saloons in kansas but there were wets there was also a conservative southern element which had come in before the war to make kansas a slave state ex-governor c v eskridge an active opponent of woman suffrage since eighteen sixty seven was chairman of the committee on resolutions mrs j ellen foster a national republican lecturer and mrs johns addressed the committee it was reminded that by common admission women municipal voters had kept the state of kansas republican yet committee and convention ignored the amendment the women now awaited the populist convention with dread the populist candidate for governor mr llewellyn declared that he would not stand for re-election on a platform that contained woman suffrage genuine disapproval of woman suffrage there was but it was rendered powerful by the accession of those who feared for the party's safety this convention proved to be one of the most thrilling experiences in the long suffrage struggle the resolutions committee sat most of the night and worn and haggard its members brought in next day a report which omitted the expected suffrage plank there was one woman member mrs eliza hudson who brought in a minority report signed by herself and seven men members then began a parliamentary tilt to keep the minority report from being heard it was however brought to debate and four hours were consumed in as tense and earnest a combat of words as had ever been heard in kansas a negro delegate with halting language declared that woman suffrage would mean party defeat and that in any event women did not know enough to vote this called forth wild and scornful laughter and the floor was dotted with delegates who sprang to the defense of the women voters of the state the minority report was adopted by a vote of three thirty seven ayes to two sixty nine nays but only after it had been amended by the addition but we do not regard this as a test of party fealty suffragists sitting on the platform glad to get even this much of an endorsement applauded the vote whereupon the editor of the chief republican newspaper the topeka capital with eyes flashing hastily left the platform and in the heat of temper indicted an editorial which called upon all republicans to understand that the amendment was now a populist measure and no republican need support it a campaign followed which acquainted women with new phases of american politics jealousy and suspicion were aroused between the parties jealousy and suspicion guided the campaign the populists believed that women in the cities being more numerous than those in the country would make the state republican the republicans held that there being more women in the country than in the cities women voters would make the state populist both were unchangeable no one expected victory to emerge from a situation so utterly unreasonable the amendment was lost by thirty four thousand eight hundred thirty seven votes ninety five thousand three hundred and two ayes and one hundred thirty thousand one hundred thirty nine nays an effort was made to keep a record of the vote by parties and much careful work and tabulation of returns was done the estimated result showed that thirty eight and a half per cent of the republicans fifty four per cent of the populists fourteen per cent of the democrats and eighty eight per cent of the prohibitionists voted for the amendment this was the most heart-breaking defeat of the suffrage struggle the majority of the people of kansas were earnest advocates of suffrage as was apparent to anyone making a canvas of the state yet the moral conviction of kansas men had been utterly surrendered to imagined party advantage idaho as both populists and republicans had declared for suffrage in their state platforms the submission of a woman's suffrage amendment was passed by the idaho legislature of eighteen ninety five unanimously in the senate and by thirty three to two in the house the national suffrage association made itself responsible for the traveling forces that covered the state during the campaign in august eighteen ninety six four state political party conventions met in boise 
the republicans splitting into regulars and silver republicans the populists and democrats fusing all four endorsed the suffrage amendment and many of the campaigners of all parties spoke for it the campaign was simple and normal costing only eighteen hundred dollars the amendment carried without organized opposition by a majority of five thousand eight hundred forty four twelve thousand one hundred twenty six four and six thousand two hundred eighty two against california the republican legislature of california carrying out the declaration in its platform submitted a woman suffrage amendment which was voted upon in eighteen ninety six participants have always remembered the campaign as the best conducted liveliest and most enthusiastic of their experience all meetings were crowded jubilant and heartily in sympathy the press was friendly no opposition appeared the hospitable western spirit of freedom for all seemed to control the situation four days before election day the chief republican newspaper the chronicle burst forth in a vituperative frenzy of hostility and used its utmost powers to arouse opposition election day brought the unique sight of chinese voters in pigtails and sandals at the polling booths chinese are denied naturalization by the united states but those born in this country are citizens by the provision of the fourteenth amendment and some five thousand were thus qualified voters faithful watchers reported that these men were rarely informed enough to mark more than one item on the ballot in which case their vote was invariably marked against the amendment when the voter was intelligent enough to mark two items he voted for the mckinley electors and against the amendment the pacific coast and especially california had made a vigorous protest against the fourteenth and fifteenth amendments because of the fear that the chinese under unscrupulous direction would dominate politics and for these reasons the state had rejected the fifteenth amendment by a curious cynicism chinese voters now with the possible knowledge of those who had once protested against them and certainly with the aid of their fellow partisans directed their votes to deny self-government to american women it was the hour of the chinese the entire state was carried for the amendment with the exception of san francisco and alameda counties eyes one hundred ten thousand three hundred fifty five nays one hundred thirty seven thousand ninety nine majority against twenty six thousand seven forty four the majority against in san francisco county was twenty three thousand seven hundred seventy two in alameda three thousand six hundred twenty seven both counties returned the republican ticket oregon in eighteen eighty two the oregon legislature submitted an amendment which was voted on in eighteen eighty four a notable list of prominent men and women were scheduled to speak and work for the amendment abigail scott dunaway the leader reported that suddenly in the midst of the enthusiastic and promising campaign politicians were seized with alarming reticence they ceased to attend meetings made excuses for breaking speaking engagements and dodged their suffrage friends on election day railroad gangs were driven to the polls like sheep and voted against us although eleven thousand two hundred twenty three votes were cast for the amendment it was lost by more than two to one the women were astounded that any one should care enough about holding them in disfranchisement to pay men to vote against the amendment as had been done they were bewildered too by the discovery that an enemy supplied with money and strong enough to intimidate a political party had been working against their amendment oregon legislatures thereafter submitted woman suffrage amendments in nineteen hundred nineteen o six nineteen o eight nineteen ten and nineteen twelve in each election the women found public sentiment strong and effective but on election day they discovered the presence of the same mysterious foe that had scattered their forces in eighteen eighty four in nineteen o six evidence appeared to indicate its character a secret circular sent out by the brewers and wholesale liquor dealers association of the state to every retail liquor seller fell into the hands of the press and was reproduced in several newspapers 
it read in part it will take fifty thousand votes to defeat woman suffrage there are two thousand retailers in oregon that means that every retailer must himself bring in twenty-five votes on election day every retailer can get twenty-five votes besides his employees he has his grocer his butcher his landlord his laundryman and every person he does business with if every man in the business will do this we will win we will enclose twenty-five ballot tickets showing how to vote we also enclose a postal card addressed to this association if you will personally take twenty-five friendly voters to the polls on election day and give each one a ticket showing how to vote please mail the postal card back to us at once you need not sign the card every card has a number and we will know who sent it in let us all pull together and let us all work let us each get twenty-five votes yours very respectfully brewers and wholesale liquor dealers association the postcard enclosed for reply was addressed brewers and wholesale liquor dealers association four thirteen four fourteen mckay building portland oregon the reverse side of the card bore this reply dear sirs i will attend to it twenty-five times zero 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 instead of a signature a number was appended despite the publicity given the plan of the brewers the campaign of nineteen o six followed its predecessors to defeat mrs abigail scott dunaway finding the cause in the slum vote another referendum was secured in nineteen o eight but again the brewers assigned to saloons the number of voters necessary to defeat the amendment and again the foreign-born were organized to defeat the native woman's plea for the suffrage it was the hour of the foreign-born in oregon new hampshire one campaign took place in the east during this period in nineteen o two new hampshire held a constitutional convention and the suffragists following their custom of appeal to all constitutional conventions conducted a preliminary campaign of preparation which was to culminate in a hearing before the convention the grange of the state was a popular and thoroughly established organization one hundred and forty local granges and all pomona or district granges were addressed before the convention met and one hundred forty five delegates pledged their support the amendment was submitted by a vote of one forty five to ninety two this was in december and the vote took place on march tenth leaving little more than two months for a campaign in a bitterly cold winter yet two hundred meetings were held the total previous vote in the state had not exceeded eighty thousand voters and these voters were circularized material was furnished weekly to the press and seventy-five ministers preached sermons in favor of the amendment so alarmed did the opponents become that an anti-suffrage meeting was arranged on march fourth with rev lyman abbott as chief speaker it was followed by a suffrage meeting the next evening the largest and most enthusiastic of the campaign the amendment received fourteen thousand one hundred sixty two votes for and twenty one thousand seven hundred eighty eight against the state suffragists considered the result excellent for so conservative a state but outside workers had come in contact with a new factor in campaigns the electorate of new hampshire was utterly demoralized by corruption and this sad fact was generally admitted the chairman of the republican and democratic committees both frankly acknowledged that a group of voters called floaters had to be paid even when they voted their own party ticket this completes the roster of the seventeen referenda in eleven different states and brings the suffrage story forward to nineteen ten that year found full woman suffrage established in four states wyoming and utah won in their territorial days and two colorado and idaho won on referendum these four states composing a great territory in the heart of the west stood for fourteen years from eighteen ninety six to nineteen ten like a democratic oasis in a desert of pretension without another acquisition there had been hours for the indian the russian the german the chinese the foreign-born the saloon hours when each had decided the limits of woman's sphere 
but no woman's hour had come meantime the possibilities of gains for woman's suffrage in the territories had not been overlooked by suffragists territories had the right to grant full suffrage to women by act of their legislatures without a referendum to the voters and many suffrage lecture and organizing tours had been made in the early days into each and all of them wyoming had led the way to victory in eighteen sixty nine utah followed promptly in eighteen seventy the mormons practiced polygamy and defended it as a tenet of the church in eighteen sixty nine george w julian of indiana had introduced a bill to enfranchise the women of utah with the expectation that they would in some undefined manner make an end of polygamy possibly this initiative prompted the utah legislature to enact a woman suffrage measure in eighteen seventy under which the women of utah territory voted for seventeen years observers agreed that they availed themselves very generally of the privilege and voted in the interest of good government but they did not eliminate polygamy which was a church and not a state institution in eighteen eighty seven senator edmonds of vermont caused the introduction and passage of a congressional bill to disenfranchise the women of utah in order to strike a blow at polygamy the territory and especially its women made heroic protests in vain utah regarded this act of congress as a discriminatory one and that fact tended to keep alive and to strengthen the suffrage sentiment in the territory after many efforts to secure statehood an enabling act was signed by grover cleveland in eighteen ninety four both parties dominant in the state placed women's suffrage planks in their platforms and the women presented a memorial to the utah constitutional convention asking that they should be recognized in the constitution their plea was granted the constitution like that of wyoming declares that the right to vote shall not be denied on account of sex the vote of the convention on this clause was i seventy five nays six absent twelve every member signed cleveland affixed the presidential signature january fourth eighteen ninety six and utah was admitted to statehood with woman suffrage in its constitution the women having been deprived of their vote by act of congress for nine years arizona and oklahoma were the two remaining territories and after the successful utah denouement in eighteen ninety six the organization committee of the national american woman suffrage association promptly marked both for suffrage onslaughts in both there proved to be as frank revelations of the nature of the opposition and its methods as were encountered anywhere along the line of suffrage march in the nineties suffragists were not as familiar with this nature and these methods as they came to be later and they were left gasping by developments on both battlefields in arizona they saw a complete volte face on the part of the council or senate from a strong favorable majority to an insidious opposition that filibustered the suffrage bill of eighteen ninety nine into innocuous desuetude they heard the popping of corks and the clinking of glasses that accompanied the barter and sale of senatorial votes to the proprietors of the prosperous saloons of the state and they were the legatees of the confession of the young president of the council who told them with tears in his eyes that the saloons of prescott had elected him and had made him their attorney that now their representatives not only threatened to repudiate him politically and take from him their legal work but to break him completely if he dared to vote for woman suffrage he was under promise to his mother not only to vote but to work for suffrage he had told his masters of the promise and they had assured him that the blame should be neatly laid upon the committee which would never report the bill and which never did report the bill working in this same devious way the saloons of arizona for eleven years successfully checkmated every effort to secure woman suffrage by territorial legislative act in oklahoma the story was the same almost down to chapter number and line on page there too in the year eighteen ninety nine advocacy of suffrage by legislators changed overnight to opposition 
there too the saloons worked hard and furiously against suffrage having organized themselves into a saloon keepers league with the purpose of protecting our interests from unjust legislation there too corks popped and glasses clinked while the vote for political freedom of women was bartered away and there too in the face of marked evidence that the people wanted woman suffrage the legislative filibuster checkmated all efforts to secure it for oklahoma women the women of two territories lost the vote through the veto of republican governors one through the decision of a democratic supreme court two through the direct intervention of an organized saloon power and one through an act of congress wyoming alone stood the test of years unchallenged it is clear that the attempts to win the territories were little more effective than the campaigns with state legislatures to get them to submit the woman's suffrage question to the voters of the states territory or state it was the work of a heartbreaking slowness this pitting of suffrage against politics in state and territorial legislatures had there been encouragement from washington republican or democratic the entire west in its territorial days would assuredly have extended the vote to women and would have defended it as gallantly as did wyoming but politics was not yet willing to allow this act of inevitable justice to prevail reviewing this forty years of effort between eighteen seventy and nineteen ten and comparing the carefully filed reports of all the states year after year the suffragists of nineteen ten arrived at some more conclusions one the more favorable public opinion was and the more numerous the pledges of state senators and assemblymen the more certain were suffrage amendments not to pass legislatures two the better the campaign the more certain that suffrage would be defeated at the polls three the majorities which defeated amendments were clearly composed of ignorant americans and foreigners controlled that is organized persuaded or bought by some master mind four the rank and file of men in the dominant parties accepted platforms and tickets as framed by party leaders without question and voted as advised five the average party leader played the game of politics using these voters as pawns and the big stakes were power patronage and graft six the real influence which dictated platforms and tickets were moneyed interests which made gigantic contributions to party treasuries or their candidates campaign funds seven here and there a statesman fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky kept faith with the people the outlook in nineteen ten was dark to win without party support seemed impossible and behind the lack of party support there was now uncomprehending public opinion which had largely lost its earlier zeal for governments by majorities the crucial deduction drawn from all the facts at hand was that public opinion must be made to understand to arise and to exert its power not only to secure justice for women but to save the nation from the threatened peril of elections controlled by invisible influences End of chapter nine part two